Good morning and welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board. My name is Kevin Mullen, Chair of the Board. If uh, the other board members could introduce themselves, starting in alphabetical order with Dr. Holmes. Hi, my name is Jessica Holmes and uh, I'm at College and I've been on the board for six years. Hi, I'm Robin Lunge. Um, I have been on the board for four years and prior to that worked in various government health policy roles. Hello, my name is Tom Pelham and I'm uh, a former Vermont uh, tax commissioner and a former Vermont finance commissioner and I've been on the board almost three years. Hi, I'm Maureen Yusufer. Uh, I've been on the board um, just a little over three years, and my background um, has been in corporate finance and other public and private boards. Thank you. And um, I'm going to ask everyone to not use the uh, chat uh, function. Again, please refrain from using the uh, chat function. Um, that is not a um, method that records a public comment. We have an open public comment period currently that you can click on on the hospital budget uh, portion of our website, and that is open through the end of the month. Um, also, at the end of the hearing, we will take public comment uh, as well. So that would be the opportunity to um, offer up public comment. Welcome to week two of hospital budget hearings. Today we're focused on the UVM Health Network and the three hospitals in Vermont. And uh, John, are you on the line? Yes, I am. So John, if, if uh, first of all, um, who is the court reporter today? Good morning, this is Sunny Donath. Hi Sunny. Sonny, if you, if you could swear in all of the uh, UVM um, uh, witnesses for today, and uh, if all the UVM um, witnesses could raise their right arm. All right. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under the penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Okay, and I think at this point it would be helpful if if everyone, all the witnesses went around and just gave their names quickly. John Brumstead. Todd Keating. Mark Stanislaus. Tom Thompson. Jen Bertrand. Steve Leffler. Rick Vincent. Anna Noonan. And Todd Keating is uh, subbing as uh, interim CFO for Anna, so he's already introduced himself. So we have somebody on our team, uh, Chair Mullen, who is prepared to uh, run the slides for us, if that's okay. Yes. Uh, um, uh, and um, uh, you tell me when you'd like us to start. As long as Sonny is ready, we're all set to go. Sonny, are you okay? Yes, I believe I'm ready. I would just remind people to uh, say their name the first time they speak so that we know who you are. But otherwise, I think we're ready to go. Thank you. Great. Okay. So, John, whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, well, Sonny, I'm John Brumstead, and I have the honor uh, and pleasure to be the president and CEO of the University of Vermont uh, Health Network. I'd like to start by uh, recognizing the Green Mountain Care Board uh, members themselves. Uh, we know that this is a heck of a lot of work, um, and it's in a sea of uh, uh, heck, a lot of, heck of a lot of other things that you're accountable for, so we appreciate your uh, attention. I want to publicly recognize and express my gratitude to the UVM Health Network leadership team. They've developed an excellent budget in the most uncertain and difficult uh, of times. Uh, it's a budget, uh, a difficult budget that strikes a balance between what we need to provide uh, the care that Vermonters need, deserve, 
and have come to expect and affordability. And this budget must be judged. The affordability must be judged in the context of time and not just in the increase in this one year, which is larger than any of us uh, would like to see. So we can go to the next slide, Jen, please. So uh, in the way of introduction, um, uh, we may have many of the UVM Health Network and affiliate board trustees on, but I'd like to recognize a few of those. These folks uh, give of their time selfishly, and it's a lot of time to provide oversight. Uh, Not-for-profit governance uh, is, uh, is difficult, uh, not always the smoothest ride, and these uh, folks provide us a lot of guidance. And as a matter of fact, uh, I'm very proud that my kitchen cabinet actually is made up of the chairs of all of our affiliate organizations. So I'd, I'd like to recognize Dr. Bob Laskowski, who's the chair of the Health Network Board, Ali Stickney, who is the vice chair of that board and recently served as the chair of the board at the Medical Center, Pat Dunhauer, who is chair of the UVM Medical Center Board, Tom Galanka, who is chair of the Center Vermont Board, and Savan Kotel, um, who is the uh, chair of the Porter Board, and also John Dwyer, uh, who is the CEO of New England Federal Credit Union, who is uh, chair of our Finance Committee. And obviously, everything that we're presenting today has been reviewed, scrutinized um, through our governance process with the Finance Committee doing a deep dive and all of our boards uh, uh, approving the process. Uh, and the uh, final product. Um, it would be great if uh, through the morning uh, we could give our presentations, uh, recognize Chair Mullen that there might um, be a need for a break in the middle of that. We've tried to strive for consistency um, and so uh, things uh, will flow. I think if we go into questions in subparts, uh, it'll be very difficult to, uh, to get uh, back on track. So we would ask your indulgence to have us uh, get through uh, as concurrently as we possibly can. Next slide. Yes, we understand that you're going to uh, do the whole presentation this morning. The only thing that I want to uh, make sure that everyone knows is that when we go to questions, we will take them one hospital at, the, at a time, starting with UVM Burlington. Okay, thank you very much. That, that works well for us. Um, uh, so um, this is the cast of characters. We uh, all signed ourselves uh, in and uh, uh, swore an oath. Um, just a couple of things to point out. Todd Keating, as I mentioned before, is double hatting today. You all know him as the UVM Health Network uh, CFO. Um, he's also serving as uh, interim CFO at Center Vermont, so he'll be presenting Center Vermont's uh, uh, budget with Anna Noonan. And Tom Thompson, who is interim president at Porter Medical Center. Uh, I don't want to date you, uh, Tom, but Tom comes to us with several decades of uh, experience experience in hospital uh, leadership, um, much in rural America, and interestingly uh, and importantly, much in leading hospitals or groups of hospitals that are part of a uh, system. So he's brought a lot of knowledge uh, with him, and he also has uh, um, uh, experience in implementing EPIC, uh, which was important. So next slide. So. Um, it's important to rec uh, remind everybody that the UVM Health Network, all of our affiliate organizations are not for profit organizations. We're not for profit. And as such, uh, we are not uh, driven by uh, finances. We are not uh, driven by any special operational uh, aspects. We're driven to achieve our mission. And we take that incredibly seriously. Um, all of leadership and uh, all of uh, governance, uh, this is our true north, to improve the health of people in the communities we serve by integrating patient care, education, and research in a caring environment. And the education and research is uh, incredibly uh, important uh, as the uh, uh, foundation of our 
integrated delivery system is built around the state's only uh, academic medical center. Um, it's important uh, in recent times. Uh, we, like virtually everybody, is uh, embarrassingly and disappointingly late to the party on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And increasingly in our mission, we are being very intentional in how we uh, serve uh, a diverse uh, population and are very inclusive, um, and that we recognize disparities in health outcomes as uh, a core issue to be dealt with if we're really going to move towards a population health approach. Um, as a not-for-profit, mission-driven, we have to have a margin at the end of the day. That margin is the only source of funding to invest back into the infrastructure and the people and the programs that support our ability to deliver um, healthcare. Um, uh, we also have a vision that by working together, we can improve people's lives. We are, uh, and I hope you all agree, um, incredibly collaborative in our approach. We're collaborative uh, amongst ourselves uh, inside of the UVM Health Network. We've done everything we can to collaborate with state government uh, in uh, New York uh, and in Vermont, um, and to collaborate uh, with uh, others in the delivery systems uh, that aren't uh, part of the UVM Health Network. And I think um, uh, when we come back to talk more about um, COVID and the current public health uh, crisis, um, that really has uh, emphasized the importance uh, of being uh, collaborative in uh, our approach in every way. So next slide, Jen. So um, here's who we are uh, today um, serving um, uh, Northwestern and Central Vermont and six counties, Northern New York. You all know that this is an incredibly uh, rural geography uh, that we cover. Um, the Academic Medical Center, I've already mentioned five community hospitals, two of which are um, uh, critical access hospitals and that we are served by um, a, a large network medical group. All of the physicians and providers that are employed at uh, any of our hospitals, by any of our hospitals, actually are now employed by uh, one network medical group. Um, we have worked to move along the continuum worked really, really hard, and it's really, really hard work to move along the continuum from independent uh, 501c3 not-for-profits through sort of a holding company with a common parent, the University of Vermont Health Network, to really be much more of an operating company. And that means that we really are striving clinically, operationally, and financially in every way to work as one organization. And that degree of integration, which is incredibly important to be able to consistently uh, and uh, sustainably provide high quality uh, healthcare is hard work. Um, we've put in uh, systems to support that, um, uh, HR system, um, uh, general ledger system, um, budgeting system, and most importantly, EPIC as our health record. And um, you can see some of our, our numbers uh, over uh, under the network numbers section. And something occurred about 18 months ago as we were putting EPIC in that was uh, really important to me. We've always said that this region has about a million people. And as a population statistic that draws uh, significant accountability that um, yeah, there's a population of about a million people that uh, we're serving. But when we put together the master patient index for EPIC, and that's where you track every record and make sure that your demographic information and everything is very consistent, um, there were, as we said, close to a million records, just shy of a million records that were in that system. And for me, as a physician and a clinician, that really changed the way 
I was thinking about this. It's nowhere near the accountability of being in the operating room or the delivery suite with a patient right there that you're totally accountable to and focused on. But having those million records brought it a lot closer to that for me and I believe others on our leadership team than just a pure population statistic. I, we feel accountable for serving the population uh, in our region, and that speaks to our mission. Um, so we're moving along, doing the hard work of developing an integrated delivery system. And then, uh, next slide, Jen. Um, coronavirus and the um, uh, disease it causes, COVID-19, hits us. And I graduated from medical school in 1978. Um, I've seen a lot of things. I've experienced a lot of uh, infectious diseases, uh, hepatitis A and B and HIV, uh, bloodborne uh, viruses. And so in the operating room or procedure areas, a finger stick or a slip of the scalpel could um, uh, actually make us as healthcare providers a vector for the disease, or we could infect others uh, on our team. Um, uh, we've had H1N1 that we rallied and did a lot of uh, uh, amazing work with vaccinations. We had Ebola, which we actually were able to uh, keep from um, heading to the pandemic stage with a lot of good public health work um, internationally. And COVID-19 has gotten out of the box and it's terrible. There isn't anybody on this call. There isn't anybody in any of our communities that hasn't been profoundly affected by uh, this. Doesn't matter if you're an introvert or an extrovert. Uh, I happen to be an introvert. Uh, even we are craving getting in a room with our colleagues or with large groups of people and just interacting. Um, it has just foundationally changed the way that we relate to each other. The only silver lining, uh, I do look for silver linings uh, always that I've seen in this situation. Um, a couple of aspects. The first is what I experienced inside of our network with 12,000 plus healthcare workers that um, our response has been something that I've been unbelievably proud of, every single one of those individuals, um, and just huge admiration for everybody. The resilience exhibited by coming to work every single day, um, the perseverance, even when we weren't flooded thankfully, uh, with cases, the anxiety created by um, being prepared and not knowing what's coming or when it's going to come is as impactful as uh, maybe even more impactful than actually getting in it and day in and day out being delivering that care. We've also seen innovation that I'm unbelievably proud of. Uh, a group uh, of folks at the Academic Medical Center have developed a playbook on how to respond if a skilled nursing facility or a communal uh, home is affected by COVID. And unfortunately, we've had to trot that out. We have people in our College of Medicine working with ways to extend our testing capabilities. We've even had folks develop a uh, new um, sort of out of the garage um, uh, ventilator. And that really has been uh, amazing to witness. And um, uh, the expressions of gratitude from those in our community has been a fuel that has continued to uh, energize and uh, keep our healthcare workers going. And, you know, we've got a few videos embedded in the presentation and some uh, photos at the end, but it's just, um, you know, it's an unbelievable uh, thing to witness our community uh, donating food and just 
uh, again, the overt uh, expressions of gratitude. Um, for me, it, boiling it down for us inside of the University of Vermont Health Network, it's reaffirmed for me culturally how everybody is committed to caring for our communities. If ever there was a time to cut and run, this was it. And nobody has even uh, uh, moved one iota towards that. So our response, obviously, and you'll get this from our presidents uh, as well when they present, was to shut off uh, non-essential services and literally over 48 hours shut off uh, our revenue. So um, I want to give you a few slides just on the COVID-19, the financial impacts, and then come back to the broader financial picture. Uh, next slide, Jen. So, um, this is just our three Vermont hospitals. Um, it's just the uh, revenue impact of COVID. And obviously anything in parentheses is uh, a negative. Um, and it's off of uh, what would be our traditional uh, budgeted uh, figures. And we saw the nadir in the decrease in activity and revenue in April. You can see that the numbers come back towards June. July has continued uh, that trend. And you can see it broken out by um, the payer categories. Total revenue losses through June, uh, $136 million. Next slide. So on the left lower corner, um, this is um, the 136 million of lost revenue. And across the page is uh, uh, the ultimate uh, impact and our 2020 year end projection. Um, so um, again, for the three Vermont hospitals uh, with nothing changing, the projected 2020 margin loss uh, because of that revenue decrease uh, would be about $120 million. Next uh, uh, column, um, we uh, are estimating that uh, stimulus and grant funds largely from the federal government uh, will offset about $65 million of that. And the next are the additional savings measures implemented. And again, hats off to uh, our leadership teams. This was the unbelievable hard work that as the uh, activities um, and the services, demand for services re reduced precipitously, our leadership teams went to work to flex our expenses down and close to $50 million worth of expense reductions. Again, only possible because we weren't providing uh, the services. But we started with preserving cash by um, uh, moving capital expenditures to only uh, break fix. The only other thing we kept going uh, was uh, Epic, and that had been slowed down. Um, we reduced all uh, purchase services, supply costs, all of those things. Uh, we worked really, really hard to bring down offset by some supply costs that went up uh, because of uh, scarcity. Um, and then uh, after we had done those non-people things, uh, we had to get into areas that were very, very difficult. Um, these are uh, managers and leaders that work with these people day in and day out and we had to move them into a furlough status, which meant that we continued to pay a portion of their salary and um, their benefits, but a major portion of their salary was uh, offset uh, by unemployment insurance, which we obviously helped them to get. Um, early on, March, early April, um, we asked, and um, it, it happened, the physicians to give up a portion of uh, their compensation, and every leader from director and above also gave up a significant portion of their salary and total uh, cash compensation um, and uh, forewent um, contributions to uh, retirement plans. So all of that in grants, um, those hard cost saving measures uh, related to decreased volumes. We're projecting that for the Vermont entities, 
will end the year about six million dollars in the red which is close to but won't trip bond covenants uh, at this point and through july we think that that's still a relatively good number but to the right of that really we had budgeted uh, close to a 50 million dollar margin uh, appropriate for a network our size and um, so we're 55 billion dollars off of budget on our margin and remember what i said a couple of slides ago um, no margin um, and we can't make the in investments a nun who is running a catholic system uh, in the 70s probably the most quoted uh, nun ever uh, in healthcare anyways said no margin no mission and that just says it all. And you know, right now, um, uh, this is um, uh, a tough spot for this particular fiscal year. Next slide, Jen. So, um, no, before one, go back one, please. So, um, uh, we've been incredibly transparent with our financials. Um, and uh, you all know that after the first quarter of 2020, well pre-COVID, uh, we were uh, $10 million in the red, and that continued through January and February. So when uh, COVID hit, we already were in a difficult financial uh, situation. I had, um, uh, in my mind and with our uh, senior leaders, we were really looking at 21, uh, uh, fiscal 21, as being the turnaround year, that towards the end of that year, we would get back to what an A-rated integrated delivery system with an academic medical center has for a margin. Um, uh, COVID uh, has, uh, has pushed that uh, out so that uh, um, uh, we're not gonna get back to that point just in this year. Um, next slide, Jen. So I think it's important to step back uh, before these next few slides and um, uh, uh, regroup on what the Green Mountain Care Board and the University of Vermont Health Network have as shared goals. First and foremost, we share the responsibility to improve the health of the Vermont population, the population we serve. And as I said earlier, we have to really heighten our awareness and our focus on the uh, health disparities of disadvantaged populations, whether it be because of race, uh, sexual orientation, um, uh, socioeconomic status. We really need to work uh, across the board to make sure that we're very focused on improving the health of the entire population. We have to uh, enhance access to do that. There isn't a day or maybe even an hour that doesn't go by where we're not hit by uh, some example of difficulties in patient access uh, in our system. At the same time, and this is a balancing act that I spoke to at the beginning, we have to reduce the growth of the total cost of care, but that has to be done on the per capita or per person level. Yes, it has ramifications for the total amount we spend, but the only way to have that be a rational approach is if we look at it on the per capita basis. And we're in a people business, we serve people, and we can only serve people with the absolute best workforce. And so we are always cognizant of the fact that our uh, initiatives um, do impact our people, and we want that to be a positive impact that improves professional satisfaction uh, every time that we possibly can. So next slide, Jen. So here's the path to financial sustainability. Uh, I mentioned that, um, you know, at least in my impatient mind um, uh, and uh, my impatient directives to our senior leadership team, 21 was going to be a significant turnaround year. Um, and um, uh, that um, uh, isn't gonna be possible because of the focus on um, uh, the COVID uh, pandemic, um, even more so than the uh, 
the uh, one-time impact of COVID on our finances. And so right from the start, um, I set out uh, with our team to look at a 30-month journey back to where we need to be as a uh, integrated delivery system with an academic medical center. And that's a three to three and a half percent margin. And really now by the end of fiscal 22, we have to be on that run rate to make uh, three to three and a half percent every year. I would point out that if you think that that's extravagant, go to the last slides in the appendix. I think there's slides 84 to 89 that show that uh, all integrated delivery systems um, in uh, our situation, that close to 90% of them are A-rated. And so if you're not an A-rated organization, um, you're in the bottom 10%, and that's uh, I believe part of a death spiral for an academic medical center. So we really need to have that three to three and a half percent margin, which actually is on the low side of A-rated organizations. Um, we have three rating agencies that review us. Um, Moody's uh, uh, did uh, move us down a notch, still within uh, A rating, but moved us down a notch in March. Um, I think that they saw both uh, our, our trend uh, that was going in the wrong direction, but also the um, uh, the industry uh, going uh, in the wrong direction. And um, so we did get a downgrade. Um, so we really need to, to focus on these margin targets. You can see where we were January year to date and what we've budgeted for our three Vermont entities uh, in 21 and how that match, uh, marches out. Um, before COVID, what I was just speaking to, we had a basic and foundational flaw in our financial structure. A basic flaw that has resulted in an unsustainable financial trend. Next slide, please. Revenues have not kept pace with expense growth. It doesn't matter if it's your personal finances, if you've got a small mom and pop shop, if you have a small business, or if you're a multinational for-profit corporation or a large not-for-profit. Everybody knows that your expenses can't grow faster than your revenues. So this slide are actuals. The last on the right is January annualized. Uh, the lowest uh, lighter green line is net patient revenue, which over this five-year period has grown at 3.4%. Um, total revenue, uh, which includes pharmacy, uh, grant income, the large part of that is outpatient and retail pharmacy, um, uh, has grown at 4.2%. And over this time period, total expenses have grown at 5.8%. You also see from this slide something that is very concerning to me you see the divergence of the total expense line and total revenue, uh, or as, uh, net patient revenue, I'm sorry. Um, and as those diverge, it means that we're not uh, floating our financial boat based on our core business, that there are uh, alternative sources of income, largely pharmacy, that are required. Next slide. So you might say, well, with that, obviously, reduce your expense growth. That's the obvious approach to that last slide. We, don't, we can't afford more revenue, so reduce expenses. So here's a breakout, uh, 20 budget to 21 budget of the growth in expenses. And this will be um, pretty much uh, uh, repeated with spe uh, specificity by each one of our presidents. Um, first point out that 2.5% of that 8.3% uh, uh, growth is pharmaceutical. We really have nothing to say about that. Um, we can do everything we can to group purchase and keep the uh, prices to a minimum, but um, that growth is driven by what's available and patient need. 
Uh, provider tax is what it is. The more services you provide, the more times you pay, the, the more services you pay 6% on. And so everybody always comes to, well, 3.9%, almost half of that growth is people. Well, obviously manage your, uh, your HR costs, your people costs. Well, I can tell you that every single manager, supervisor and above spends hours every day managing their workforce. Um, first, we need the most skilled workforce and we're in a rural environment and it's hard to get uh, those people and we're on a regional if not a national scale to, to uh, get those folks. Um, we, down to the cost center level, have benchmarks on productivity and the number of uh, FTEs. And so, um, yes, we could reduce the number of folks that we have working for us, and that will go directly back to reducing access to necessary services and potentially even programmatic changes. There's no buffer left in uh, this system. And so we're up against it. We're managing expenses, I believe, as well as anybody in the country. The other box is 1.6%, but pharmaceutical and uh, people costs uh, are, uh, are driving this. So how have we collectively gotten into this position uh, with this basic flaw where revenues aren't covering this expense growth. Next slide. So stick with the top box um, and look at the commercial rate increases that we have been granted in our three organizations, 2017 through 2020. And when I first said that the affordability of this budget needs to be put in the context over time and not just with this one year's increases, which again are greater than uh, we would want, um, uh, you see that over a five year average, even with the increases that uh, uh, are required this year, we're below 4% over this time period, which uh, is uh, incredibly reasonable. I would tell you what you already know in each one of those boxes, in each one of those years, we have come forward with what we um, have calculated carefully is required to cover the expense growth in each one of those years. And we haven't gotten permission to uh, take those increases. We don't cry wolf, we don't pad budgets. Uh, what we do is very carefully calculate what is required to cover the cost shift and cover uh, um, the uh, growth of expenses that I just showed you. And in 2021, those are the rate increases that are required. They're not um, something that we just made up. Uh, they're not uh, an option. Um, they uh, aren't my opinion or anybody's opinion. It's math. It's math. The calculation says that that's what we need to cover our expenses. Um, below uh, will be covered uh, in each of the president's conversations. Next slide. So this is the result of um, uh, what happens when your revenues uh, are under what your expense growth is. Um, and this is what Moody's and the other rating agencies, particularly for the UBM Medical Center, will definitely react to if we don't turn this. This isn't uh, COVID, it can't be fixed by one-time money. Ask any legislator um, what one-time money does. It makes you feel good for a couple of months, but it doesn't fix underlying uh, basic structural issues. Um, uh, this trend just can't continue. And I'd like to go to the next slide because it really sets my blood pressure off when I see this one. Next slide. Um, so our plan, 
to uh, achieve financial sustainability, and again, these are our three Vermont entities, um, and this is 20 budget to 21 budget as the last two data points with the other four being actuals. Um, and again, look at this over time, our net revenue, net patient revenue over that time period, 4.2%. Our total revenue, when you put in um, the um, uh, pharmaceuticals and some other things, 5%. Total expense over this time is growing at 5.6%. And this tracks almost right on with what the Office of the Actuary for CMS has uh, cataloged and projected as expense growth. Uh, over this time period, and we better get used to it because they're projecting it for the next uh, seven to 10 years as well. Um, so this comes right from there. So these are the uh, increases that we need. And again, if you look at it over time, um, it makes these um, uh, not easy to swallow, but uh, uh, much more reasonable. So next slide. Um, so our budget is based on the need, just to summarize, for revenues to cover expenses, um, uh, and we just can't do that within the three and a half percent that patient revenue growth. Um, this uh, we've pointed this out a couple uh, years uh, running now. It just can't get there from here, and. We all know you've gotten into it a little bit uh, with the administration around the uh, cost shift. Um, we have to have the revenues to cover uh, not just normal inflation, but also the part of inflation that's not covered by the government payers. Um, and um, uh, we need to uh, achieve that three to three and a half percent margin. And again, I'd point you to uh, the slides that we put in the uh, uh, appendix. You know, we no, don't normally do this, but I think uh, it's important at this point that uh, we allow Mark Stanislaus to do a bit of a deep dive into how we calculate the required commercial rate increase. Because again, like I said, it's, um, it's precise, as precise as you can be uh, in this world. And uh, Mark and the other CFOs and Todd Keating are uh, obviously maestros in this area. But I think it's important just for Mark to take a few minutes uh, and take us through this. And then we'll move on to the uh, UVM Medical Center. So Mark. Okay. Thank you, John. Well, just for the record, this is Mark Stanislaus. Well, Jen, could you move to slide 18, please? Okay, so what we did in this year's budget process is we took those same components that we've kind of looked at every single year, but we de well, but we deconstructed them at a lower level to kind of show the math in a little bit more specifics. And we spoke just on four general categories for the commercial rate setting process for the hospitals. Um, well, changes in payment in payment rates, there's a list of things that were primarily what drove that category with well, unit cost inflation, which is by far the largest driver of the commercial rate request. And we're going to speak about that in a little bit more detail coming up. Financial sustainability and other payer offsets. And those other payer offsets, I think John just mentioned it, but Medicare and Medicaid have not kept up with just pure inflation. So so, so those are going to be an offset to that. Each one of the affiliate hospitals are going to speak to each one of these in a little bit more detail. But we just wanted to give you a preview up front and the manner in which we went about this. And we attempted to make it a mathematical exercise to show a lower level of detail um, behind the request for the commercial rates. Next slide, Jen. This is just a slide to say, based upon the structure of the individual hospitals, if it's an academic medical center, a sole community hospital, or either a critical access hospital, all of these factors might impact those different institutions a little bit differently. So the numbers may vary some. Next slide, Jen. Okay. so. This is a slide that we attempted to say, how do we compare the hospital 
will growth rate for all of its commercial business to the request from the commercial payers as it relates to the qualified health plan. Um, we could spend a whole presentation on this slide. So, you know, we don't want to get into um, a lot of detail, but I do want to speak to some of the specifics on this. You know, Obviously, there's a challenge here to compare these two processes, but I think we need to find ways to work together to better understand the correlation. Um, it's not going to be easy. This is complicated work. Um, you know, you're dealing with challenges of different fiscal years between the hospitals and the commercial rate setting processes. How does population movements across the state impact the hospital process compared to the commercial rate setting or process? How does the aging of the population impact the state's only academic medical center that is the only institution that offers certainly high, certain highly skilled and specialty services within the state that we know as you get older, our populations you know, require and they're good services to add to the quality of the life and and when we look at the commercial payer rate setting process it really takes two years for the commercial payers to adjudicate their commercial rate setting process like in in the fy 20 one rate request they had the settlement for the 2019 year so it's very important i think to look at this at minimum over a three-year average I also think it's very important to take a look at this from actual to actual to actual, not well, not budget to budget, because a true driver of cost is budget to budget, or is not budget to budget. It, it, it is actual to actual, and you know the hospital process. Well, the hospitals have that same run rate. I think it only impacts us another. E here, but when we submit our 21 budget, you know, we don't know where our 20 year is going to end yet too. So there's also a lag there. And, you know, I just want to pause that we took year to date, January, 2020 annualized, because this is a very unusual year. And that was the best period that we could land on to say, how do we take a three year look at this? And, you know, these are the numbers with the show the Vermont hospital trend um, in the range of 6.4%. The Blue Cross Blue Shield is in the range of 8.2%. And MVP is in the range of 5.8%. You know, um, and the impact of this, well, that we do need to be um, um, sen sensitive to. And what's driving the three year average a little bit higher is the ask in FY21. And, you know, we do need to be sensitive that there's a compounding impact here that while some of these percentages might look very, very close together, you know, every point of a percent is meaningful. And particularly when you think about it over multiple years, well, the financial impact um, of that becomes more and more important as compounding takes place. But, you know, and 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 I can say in the FY21 numbers, um, um, uh, the orders just came out with a Friday before. So we did the best that we could do to interpret those orders to say, you know, what that rate trend is. And the, then the other thing that I want to say about these is this is specifically only focusing on the medical and the pharmaceutical expense trends. So this includes this in, this includes price, this includes, includes utilization, this includes volume, this includes movements from patients from one county to another county. So, you know, um, it's very difficult well, to deconstruct how the rate compares. So you really need to look at it as a holistic point of view and then break down those percentages on how much of that is utilization how much of it is volume, how much of it is increased access, how much of it may be related to aging, and then how much of it is the unit price change. Um, so, and, and, and you know, noting um, that the total approvals for the qualified health plan are much lower than that um, in FY21, 
but those reductions are coming from other line items within that process. You specifically need to look at the utilization and, and the price trends or related to the medical and the pharmaceutical inflation. And there might be a couple other categories that has an indirect effect also. But you know, we believe the commercial ass if over the three year period in FY21, if you look at it from an average perspective, are are you know are you know right in line and particularly as you look at the unit cost changes, they are only there to fund the increased expense that our organizations are receiving. So if we could go if we could go to the next slide, please, Jen. Okay, so these are those four categories that we attempted to break down. Um, up, up top is the effective rate increase, the effective commercial rate increase for each one of the, the hospitals. And this is more of a mathematical exercise. Um, there is the per 1% you know, budget impact. I would just like to share there that, you know, this is one of the misconnectivities is that per 1% is for the nine month period of January 1st through September. Um, and, and, and then if you go down, those are the dollar amounts in each one of those categories to those four categories before. And it is a simple mathematical exercise. You take um, for the medical center's case, you take the 4.7 million and you divide it into the expense growth. And as you can see, the largest well, the largest driver of the 7.97% is the unit cost inflation of 6.7%. And if you go down below, um, uh, like I said, each one of the affiliates are going to speak to this um, as it relates to each one of their organizations. But that's the breakdown. So in the medical center's case, the 30 the 31.7 million equates to an overall 2% increase from a total expense perspective. Um, obviously, um, that is highly driven by salary and fringe. But to John's point, um, if you look at the medical center, um, salary and fringe drive 64% of that 31 million. The other 22% is driven by pharmaceutical and med surge. At CVMC, 54% of it is salary and 32% of it is medical and pharmaceutical. And the cost structure is a little bit different at a critical access hospital. Well, so those ratios are a little bit different. 83% of theirs is driven by salary. So, you know, this was just our attempt to break it down at a lower level of um of detail to, you know, hopefully take the numbers that we've said before in the past and put much more specifics around what is driving the ask. Thank you, Mark. Um, so um, uh, again, we've tried to stay consistent with uh, how we're presenting uh, the financial uh, aspects uh, of the uh, presentation through the uh, the three uh, hospitals. Um, there's a unique story to Mark's point uh, at each hospital um, that uh, will be important for the the president uh, to speak to, and they will. So let's move along and uh, Dr. Steve Leffler and Rick Vincent, uh, CFO, if you could uh, move into the the medical center. Thank you, John. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Steve Leffler. Uh, next slide, Jen. So uh, I think it just is worth mentioning that 2020 has been a challenging year for the medical center, even prior to COVID. Uh, we had a temporary closure of our Feeney Allen operating rooms, which had a major impact on access to care. It had a major impact on our budget. I'm happy to say that it's fully open now, but right after we were able to reopen it in February, we shut it back down because of COVID. So we had multiple months where we were doing either no elective cases or less than what we had budgeted. Epic Go Live um, was a major challenge for the medical center. We had clinical and revenue cycle systems that were impacted greatly. That was a tremendous amount of work that we did between November and the new year to get things stabilized. Um, and then COVID hit 
and basically upended everything that we do. Starting in early March, we started having incident command and leadership meetings every single day, seven days a week to make sure that we were prepared to manage COVID patients, keep our staff as safe as possible, and be a community resource to work with the state, the government, our local leaders to make sure that we were participating as much as possible to keep Vermonters as safe as possible. Um, uh, on Memorial Day weekend, we had an issue with the rehab component of the Fannie Island campus, and we relocated uh, our uh, in acute inpatient rehab patients from the Fannie Allen back to the Medical Center Shep 3 North. Um, that's the only acute inpatient rehab unit in the state of Vermont. And it was critically important that we continue to offer those services for our stroke patients, spinal cord injury patients, and many other patients who can't be discharged without having a, a comprehensive acute inpatient stay. Um, we've had significant leadership turnover. I became permanent in January. There's a couple other VPs that are retiring or changing roles. So we've had some turnover on the leadership team this year. We have some ongoing recruitments. And over the summer, um, and this is a good news story and a bad news story, we've been very busy. Um, for um, most of July and August, we've run in the high 90% census range our ORs are back to 98% of normal activity. Um, and we've been busy because we've been working very hard to maintain single occupancy beds um, for our COVID patients and keeping some COVID beds set aside for every day. Um, so managing high volume of care people who need us um, for their care and managing the COVID situation has been a challenge. Next slide, Jen, please. Um, I thought it was important to show a slide that um, if you look between 2017 and 2020, transfers, this is a, specifically of Vermonters to the Academic Medical Center continue to grow every year. So if you look at um, trauma services, cardiac care, stroke patients, NICU patients, psychiatry patients, um, anyone who needs inpatient dialysis must be transferred to the medical center. And what I would say is for the state of Vermont, for most of these services and a number of others I haven't highlighted, we are 100% of the capacity for some of that care. So if people can't be transferred to the Academic Medical Center in Burlington, you have to leave the state or not receive the care. And so we, we um, are proud that we can offer these services and we're proud to be able to take these transfers, but it does take coordination and, and in many of these areas, um, we feel like we must take the transfers no matter what's going on. Um, so um, really important work. Next slide, please. And the other thing I would add to that is if you look at many of these services are provided at a significant loss. So for dialysis services for the state of Vermont, we lose about $14 million per year. For many of the medical specialties, we lose about 10 million a year. For psychiatry, 7 million a year. And um, that's not even counting emergency department sitters, uh, which we lose about a million dollars a year in uncompensation for the sitters. For our rehab services, we lose about five million dollars a year. For transplant services, three million, and for our stroke patients, around two million. Basically, we uh, use services that generate a margin to offset those that lose money. Many of the transfers that we just showed you fall in this category of uh, losing money on those cases. Um, but we are um, honored to be able to care for Vermonters who need us and be an academic center and train the next generation of learners on this work. Um, but it's critically important that we have the ability to offset these losses of services. Um, next slide, please, I think switches to Rick. Rick, you ready to go? Yes, good morning, everyone. This is uh, Rick Vincent. So Mark uh, covered a little bit of this earlier, but just um, to, to dive a little bit deeper on this, the the Good issue. Good morning. How are you? Fine. Who is that? Oh, hi, Josh. <laughs> okay, can I ask understand. whoever that is to mute themselves, please? Whoever's yelling at Josh, please mute themselves. 
Uh, just to get a little bit more detail on the impact that not receiving um, a revenue rate increase has on not covering expense inflation. Uh, so Mark went into a little bit more detail on what it looks like um, for this year, specifically using our cost um, increases this year. But in general, I think we've we've presented this in the past that if you use you know the the ballpark of um, you know, in any given year, our expense inflation is going to be around 3%. Um, and when you take a look at the fact that we have about half of our uh, revenue base that we don't get a, a rate increase on, means you essentially have to make up the difference um, through the, the commercial uh, rate uh, increase process. So when you use that that six percent, I think every you know every year we've been right around that you know that number. That's kind of a key number that we need to receive to uh, to keep pace with uh, expense inflation. When you look at that impact compared to the rate increases that we've had the last uh, several years, you can see that it's it's large numbers that it impacts the the margin of the the UVM Medical Center. Um, on top of this, which um, I think Mark uh, touched on a little bit as well, is the what's not shown here is the compounding impact of um, of the of these uh, of these issues, where you really never make up for lost ground. Um, you know, even if you do get a rate increase that covers the cost of, in, of expense inflation in one year, it, the rate increase is on a base that is obviously lower than it, it should be. So the compounding impact of this year over year. Um, really has a, a detrimental uh, impact. Uh, next slide, John. So this is a slide, I think we've covered this in the last few uh, presentations where we've talked about the fact that the rate increase um, not covering expense inflation has, um, has negatively impacted our margin, uh, but it also uh, would be even worse if it had not been for um, how much we've been able to to grow our outpatient pharmacy uh, business that it somewhat has masked the real impact that, um, that that not getting a rate increase to keep up with expense inflation has had. Um, so I was actually quite surprised when when you see this on a graph, it's it's pretty stark. When you look back at 2016, which was the last year that we received a six percent uh, commercial rate increase. Our margin at that point in time was 6.3% at the end of that year. Our total margin taking all of uh, both our core business of seeing patients and uh, our out farm, uh, outpatient pharmacy business. When you pull that out of the margin number um, in 2016, our margin on actually our core business, which was which is seeing patients, uh, was 4.4 percent. So the, the gap between those two numbers was, you know, was fairly uh, was fairly small. But as you move ahead, um, the last uh, three and four years, you can see that in 2018, on our core business, we were just barely above uh, break even. Um, in 2019, we actually lost uh, 1.8 percent on our core business. Um, and then uh, in January of this year, that gap has grown even more where um, it, I think hopefully, you know, helps to highlight the impact that um, that the rate increase not keeping up with expense inflation has had because, you know, that total margin obviously includes that pharmacy business. Uh, Jen, next slide. So just a little bit of detail on our some of the assumptions that we have uh, in our budget. I think some of this was covered in our narrative, but um, just to highlight that. Um, so admissions and discharges, we are um, anticipating a 6% increase from the budget to uh, last year's budget to this year's budget. Uh, the majority of that is for us uh, increasing our McClure 5 uh, capacity. Uh, we do have a small increase that we projected in terms of all our cases, uh, primarily from trying to create a little bit more capacity at the Fannie Allen uh, campus. Uh, CMI, we are projecting to be higher in the 21 budget. Uh, we have several initiatives that is looking to try to improve how we um, are documenting and coding the acuity of our, uh, of our patients. Um, we have an engagement that um, was actually supposed to start this summer 
uh, got a little bit delayed due to the COVID impact um, that really is focused on edu- re-educating our coders and our providers. Um, uh, we've got some new policies that are, that are coming along. And then finally, a uh, project that we've been looking to implement for quite some time now is a system called 3M 360, uh, which is a, a data mining tool that um, has attached to it artificial intelligence that looks for where we may have missed uh, the ability to, to truly um, uh, document the, the acuity of our of our patients. And that's important, obviously, um, for uh, revenue, but it's also important in terms of our quality metrics. You know, we've seen over the last few years that you know, when we look at length of stay, uh, mortality, um, some of the different quality metrics that um, one of the things that's, you know, that's holding us behind a little bit is the fact that we're not, you know, we still have some opportunity to more properly document the acuity of the patients that we're, uh, that we're caring for here at the UVM Medical Center. Uh, medical group volumes are increasing a little bit uh, due to some new providers that we're, uh, that we're bringing on. Um, And then we bulleted out there just some ancillary volume changes. Uh, The last two bullets there, um, uh, CT scans and NukeMed, they are increasing. Uh, We did, you probably have seen the data uh, in the past in terms of Vermont being a low utilizer of uh, radiology services. Uh, We did kind of check that data again, and it's still the case. Uh, When you take a look at 2019 in a database that we have access to called SG2, um, if you apply the regional utilization rates uh, to our Burlington HSA, in 2019, we would have done about 27,700 CT scans. Um, when you apply the national utilization rates, we would have done uh, well over 28,000 CT scans. And in 2019, we actually only did 20,000 CT scans in the, uh, in the Burlington HSA. So while volumes are increasing in these areas, it's still well below um, utilization trends. Then finally, GI and endoscopy. Uh, we do have some new providers coming uh, on board, and that's an area that we have fairly significant backlogs that um, that we're trying to uh, try to address. Next slide, Jen. So this Mark uh, went through in uh, some detail in the network section. Um, I'll maybe just talk about a couple of the, uh, the items on here. So first, that payment change, that payment rate change um, that's built into the commercial, the required commercial increase that we have this year. Um, I think we've shared this in the past that we go into a year obviously with certain assumptions in terms of payer mix, what we think we're going to get for um, uh, rate increases, what we believe Medicare will be doing in terms of rates. But every year that that tends to change. Um, there are payer policies that come along that reduce the amount that we receive from commercial increases. Um, there's things that come along from Medicare that we do our best to build into the budget that change during the year. For example, we, we're we assuming a, a 0% change in terms of Medicare outpatient rates, but a few weeks ago, it looks like there may be a uh, potential where Medicare might actually decrease outpatient rates. So every year, we we, we tend to, to kind of fall behind in terms of our payment rates never really um, achieve the level that uh, that we plan for in our in our budget. Uh, next slide. Uh, just to break down the net patient revenue and fixed perspective payment, um, and then other revenue increases in our budget. Um, so as you've seen, our total patient revenue is growing by 5.7 percent. Um, 1.9% of that is pharmaceutical increase. Um, so that's, you know, in our minds is just a pure pass through, um, you know, that's whatever we have for volume there is, um, and the cost that we incur is going to generate, um, just additional revenue. Uh, the aggregate rate increase, when you take it, um, all the assumptions that we have, the commercial rate increase and the Medicare assumptions that we have in there is about a 3%, uh, increase. Uh, the lower collection rate uh, we've talked about, I uh, just mentioned, 
Um, something that we didn't spend a lot of time on in this presentation, hopefully um, we did a good job at kind of pointing this out last year um, in that you know, this area, Chittenden County and our, and our main market area continues to grow, continues to grow in terms of patients and population. Uh, when you break down our, our total revenue growth this year, about 1.7 of that is just growth in the number of uh, patients. Um, we haven't seen new population data, but just anecdotally, I'm sure that that growth has continued this past year um, in terms of population moving to our service area. Um, so this is this is something that every year we've tried to point out that we're just caring for more and more uh, patients here in our uh, service area. And then finally, a small piece for the CMI increase, which um, as we address that does uh, increase revenue. Non-patient revenue is growing by 42 million. Uh, the biggest piece of that is our outpatient pharmacy revenue. Um, as I pointed out in this first bullet here, um, that that obviously comes with expense as well. So the cost of outpatient pharmacy drugs uh, goes up as that volume increases. Uh, we have to hire more staff to, to, to address that volume. So when you look at the actual margin impact of that increase, uh, it nets out to about $9 million. And then finally, just a, an accounting change that um, that actually impacts both revenue and expenses. Um, so historically, our grant revenue has been reported as a non-operating uh, revenue. So has the grant expenses. So it's been in the total margin, but not in the operating margin. In this year's budget, um, both of those are moving up into operating. So grant revenues are now operating revenues and grant expenses are operating expenses. Um, so it has a zero impact on the margin, but um, that $7 million is contributing to uh, part of this, this increase in non-patient revenue. Uh, next slide, John. Uh, a breakdown of the expenses. Uh, so our expenses are going up by 125 million or 8.7%. Um, most of these numbers I think have been presented already, but inflation um, is 2.2% of that, uh, which is 32 million. Uh, the outpatient pharmacy increase is 1.9 of that. So that gets back to the outpatient revenue uh, in the volume as that grows, um, uh, the, the expenses there increase. Uh, salaries and benefits. So this is without um, the the inflation piece attached to it, but just purely uh, FTE increases, um, which are due to uh, to patient volume and premium labor. Um, and you can see the rest of those, uh, those expense increases there. Uh, I'm sorry. There, I think there was a a sound and and that last part cut out. You said, and you can see what. It sounds like there's dog barking, but can you repeat that again? It's not, it's not my dog. <laughs> um, I was just highlighting the rest of the, uh, the, the expense increases there. And then physician FTEs, we are growing about 18 uh, from the uh, last year's budget to this year's budget. Um, you can see the, the specialties that are, uh, that are increasing FTEs. Uh, staff FTEs, we are growing by 129 or 2%. Um, 95 of that goes back to the that volume assumption that we have that we're increasing our McClure 5 uh, capacity. So that comes with uh, some increased uh, FTEs. Uh, we have 29 uh, advanced practice providers um, that are being um, that are being put into the uh, to the mix, uh, primarily in the primary care mental health integration uh, space. Uh, we have 22 FTEs related to the outpatient pharmacy um, increase, um, which um, I covered a little earlier. Um, 14 of the staff are related to those imaging volumes that are increasing. Uh, we have about 37 staff across other areas that are increasing due to volume and systems. And finally, uh, through our budget process this year, we did decrease um, or eliminate about 68 positions um, uh, to, to, to get the, the FTE growth to, to really be just purely on what we need to take care of patients and to, to, you know, the increases that truly align with the volume increases that, uh, that we've seen. Uh, next slide. 
I think that's back to you, Steve. Thank you, Rick. Uh, so looking ahead uh, for 21 and beyond, across the whole network, we're spending a significant amount of time reevaluating our capital priorities, given our significant losses that will impact um, where and how we are able to spend money going forward. Um, we are making a plan for how we'll deal when and if COVID returns to Vermont. So we're building a plan for how we might manage elective services over the winter and really trying to build a system where we could care for people who need us, even with some COVID present, all the way up through there's so much COVID that we pretty much have to preserve all of our capacity from our providers, ventilators, and space to care for COVID patients almost exclusively. Um, Chittenden County population continues to grow. Clearly, many of our primary care docs are telling us that their patients who typically go to Florida for the winter are planning to stay in Vermont this winter. We believe that could have a big impact on um, services that are needed for our patients and possibly in patient census as well. And what I can tell you is prior to the pandemic, through the pandemic and in the future, the UVM Medical Center is committed to using our resources and expertise to be a state asset especially in difficult times such as COVID-19, but all the time. Next slide, please. Um, I wanna make one comment before we get to this. I just wanted to give a day in the life of the medical center. So if you look at the medical center this morning, I want to let people know that we have a three-day inpatient survey started this morning for uh, the Board of Pharmacy. We have one patient waiting at an outside facility to get transferred here that we didn't have capacity for last night, but we're working to move here now. We have three psychiatric boarders at the medical center emergency department. We're planning for 70 inpatient admissions today. We currently believe we'll have 43 discharges. Right now, our census is what we call level two, meaning we can manage it, but it's gonna be tight. But with that change in admissions and discharges by tomorrow, we'll probably be in, in level three census. Um, we basically are managing in Chittenden County right now that uh, a bit of a crisis with providers for our nursing homes. We provide medical direction for five out of six of those nursing homes. And over the past about 10 days, um, we've had a difficulty having enough providers care for patients. And so a lot of time has been spent with our family medicine department and our internal medicine departments coming up with a staffing plan to make sure patients are still flowing there. So we've been extremely busy with that work. And now to finish up for the medical center, I thought it would be uh, nice to tell a story. So I think many people here know that in the spring, Birchwood had a true crisis with uh, COVID-19 patients. And they got to a situation where they were, um, they had enough of their staff that was out either with COVID or being quarantined. And uh, they had many positive patients and they, they contacted us and said, we're gonna have to do something. We don't have enough people to provide for patients here with COVID-19. And so we worked collaboratively, collaboratively with Birchwood. We used uh, Home Health and Hospice, UVM Medical Center Hope, or Network Home Health and Hospice. And we come up with a staffing plan to keep patients in their home at Birchwood. And we staffed it with our geriatricians and palliative care docs, our VNA nurses, and we were able to keep almost all of those patients in their homes, getting the care they needed, maintaining vital capacity at the hospital. And uh, it was an amazing thing to see. And so um, no one can tell it better than Dr. Gramling. So I'm gonna let him do it for us by video. I hope. <laughs> it's coming. My friend and colleague, Mike Lamantia called me on a Thursday uh, when they recognized that they had their first positive tests of, of, of uh, residents in their nursing home. And then we put together a team of palliative care and hospice experts to help be on the ground. It involved a, a collaboration really quickly between um, the medical center staff, physician and nursing staff, and our colleagues at EVM Home Health and Hospice. That place was filled with people who were leaning into this as best as they knew how, uh, not to abandon these people who who saw Birchwood as their home and, and did not want to transfer to the hospital if they were to get sick, acknowledging that they would die where, where they have lived. So by the time we were there for a couple of days, we realized that we needed to provide 24-7 support 
the medical center rented a, a RV that we lived in behind the uh, Birchwood in Dyads. We had made sure that there were two of us on call any given night. The chaplain we were working with was doing night rounds on a person who had been doing pretty well during the day, a man who had dementia. He was uh, acutely short of breath. Um, the image is striking, you know, including what we see with disease, that the, that the frothing of the, of the fluids at the mouth can, can uh, be substantial. And so I uh, quickly put on my PPE and got inside. And when I came down the hall, the first thing I, could, I saw were the care aides at the bedside um, who were, you know, one of the things that was ubiquitous for our experience was the people working there were not gonna leave the people they loved. They were gonna stay there and they were gonna see this through. And the aides were helping to change the music and change the lighting and do everything that they could to help. We're also terrified that this is not something they had seen and experienced. The nurse was there who met me and was was leaning in as well and also recognizing that the doses of medicines that she is used to doing are not working um, and was similarly terrified. I came in the room and was there with our chaplain. We were able to, over the next two and a half hours, get this man comfortable with doses of medicines that were not necessarily unfamiliar to me in a crisis um, end of life situation. And during that time, we were able to talk with the family who had been, that our geriatrics colleagues had been in contact with this family right on through the process. We were very aware of what this man's wishes were, the family was aware of what was happening. And they wanted to be present so he wasn't alone when he was dying. And um, we were able to get them on the phone and they were able to do some um, uh, family rituals with him. And what the family did for asked us to do is take the phone and, and wrap it around his head. And so they could say, you're loved here, you're loved here, you're loved here. Um, and they felt very connected to him. And it was um, inspiring for me and to be in such an intimate space. And also disorienting to be doing that at a time when he was also not yet comfortable. This was, this was hard for family to see. It took us about two and a half hours to get him comfortable in an acute care setting with the right medications and IV and subcutaneous medicines, probably would have taken me about 30 minutes or so. And we had been working for a number of days recognizing we needed that. Um, and we, from a, just a systems institution, um, uh, uh, regulatory perspective, we had been unable, unable to achieve that by then. We did two days later, um, but that's an example of a, of a systems level piece that made it harder to care for this man. Those coming 10 days have been the most meaningful of my professional career. We know that as unpredictable and different as this disease is, it's still a disease and we have we have the knowledge of how to manage it. Um, that when our institutional boundaries come down, um, like UVM came and uh, brought an RV, they built a place for us to change our clothes and in and out of PPE so we didn't have to do it in the bushes that we can get the medications and the training for people to use them. And that people can feel they're not alone in it. They, they can have someone by their shoulder that says, you know, yeah, you're doing the right thing, you're doing a good job, um, and this part, and I'm here with you. Those things are gonna, what, are gonna be what gets us through this together um, and with a legacy that we can be proud of. Great. Good morning, everyone. This is Anna Noonan. I'm going to uh, present uh, Central Vermont Medical Center. Next slide, please. Just to reground us a little bit about who we are. Um, Central Vermont's mission um, is to be central to our community and to care for a lifetime. We have about 1,700 employees. We care for about 66,000 people uh, within our towns and cities in central Vermont. We have a total of 100, uh, 122 licensed hospital beds and 153 skilled nursing uh, beds. We have 23 medical practices and we have uh, 283 providers, 213 of which are physicians that are now part of the UVM Health Network Medical Group and 70 advanced practice uh, professionals representing 25 medical specialties. And we see over 400,000 patient encounters per year. Next slide. Um, as you heard Dr. Leffler mention, 2020 has been certainly an extraordinary year for everyone um, and CVMC was no different. 
We have uh, continued to see experience and have been experiencing roving margins. Um, uh, a major shift continues in our payer mix. We're at 51% Medicare, Medicaid now. The growth in our pharmaceuticals is increasing rapidly and our labor inflation is as well. And we're also challenged by unpredictable volumes. We can actually double our volumes within our acute care setting within a single day. Back in October, we went live with Epic and our practices and our revenue cycle. And we are continuing with stabilization efforts at this point. And we're also preparing ourselves for wave two, which will occur across the rest of our enterprise. So resource consumption dedicated to those efforts has also been um, uh, a challenge for us this year. And then in March, as along with everyone, uh, we uh, experienced the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and I will share later um, all the efforts that were undertaken by Central Vermont and our team of providers, clinicians, our staff, and the support of our community that really enabled us to deliver the care that our community needed at a time they needed us most. We also ha have had to um, restrict capital expenditures to maintain our liquidity. So I think the Green Mountain Care Board has heard me talk about the deferred maintenance that has existed here at CVMC for a number of years. Uh, we are continuing um, to defer uh, capital expenditures um, uh, with the exception of patient safety issues or break fix. And like everyone, we also have workforce constraints. A significant issue for us here in the central Vermont region is retaining um, and uh, recruiting the talent that we need to care for our patients. So we believe we've submitted a budget that we need to continue to provide the same high quality service that our community has come to expect. Next slide, please. Todd, I'm gonna give this to you. Sure, good morning everybody. My name is Todd Keating. I'm the Network Chief Financial Officer for the University of Vermont Health Network. I am also the Interim Chief Financial Officer for Central Vermont Medical Center. Uh, in this section for CVMC, you'll see a lot of the themes are similar uh, to what you've heard from the medical center and the overall introduction uh, for the organization. This slide here naturally is specific to CVMC. Um, you can see that the, the parallel between the total revenues and the net patient service revenues, um, you know, are, are moving up in a positive direction, but not necessarily keeping uh, pace with expenses as they had um, in prior periods. Uh, so we are projecting for uh, fiscal 21 uh, to have a 0.47% uh, operating margin uh, with the uh, commercial lift that we're asking for. And that translates into $1.2 million. Um, we are working on a lot of other initiatives during the year to try to uh, close the gap on the expense growth and the, the revenue uh, trending that we're seeing now. Next slide, please. So on this slide, this is one of the themes that you've seen and heard before. When you look at the over, um, overwhelming majority of the increases for Central Vermont Medical Center, uh, they would be in salary and fringes as well as the pharmaceuticals. Now, one of the things that's challenging um, Central Vermont Medical Center is the use of travelers. Uh, we basically, um, as although we want to be aspirational with regard to being able to replace traveling nurses with full-time equivalents, uh, it's been a challenge that we haven't been able to meet in the short term. Uh, so what we did was to correctly budget for the amount of travelers that we feel we will be utilizing during 2021. Uh, that was actually an increase of 10 FTEs from the budget of 2020 to the budget of 2021. And to give you an idea as to the dollar impact, the delta between a full-time uh, nurse, uh, or I should say registered nurse equivalent, uh, and the traveler is an additional $98,000 for that traveling nurse. So if we uh, increase the budget for reality of recognizing that we would not have the full-time nurses on board, we would have travelers, that increased the budget by $980,000 uh, $980, and change just in the, that one capacity as well. Um, when you look at the pharmaceuticals, you'll see in a later slide that I'm going to share with you that the growth in this really has been in the oncological uh, drugs. That really uh, has been the the growth, uh, you know, between um, you know the inflation, but the actual cost of drugs uh, for oncology drugs has been a, a tremendous 
uh, let's say, a force behind the growth in this area. You know, the provider tax is pretty self-explanatory and other is a conglomerate of purchase services and a variety of other uh, miscellaneous uh, categories that got glommed into one, uh, which will equal the 8.2% growth that we see here. Again, next slide, please. So if we go to this slide, again, this is the breakout you know, of the different areas and how they, the percentages add up into that 8.2% as listed on the previous slide. You know, one of the things that we we, uh, we felt would be interesting and important to know uh, for everybody is that um, during the pre-COVID, and I'm saying pre-COVID, which was the October through February period, uh, the organization's expenses were over budget by three and a half million dollars. Uh, naturally, with the COVID shutdown, uh, the focus turned not only onto the patient care that was delivered, which for CVMC was outstanding, but we recognized that we had to sit there and redo our expense structure during this time as well in anticipation that all those stimulus monies were going to be available, that they would not be the only source of uh, recovery uh, available to us, that we had to pull back on capital, as Anna said, but we more importantly had to pull back on the operating expenses for the organization. And in fact, we did that. And for the period of uh, April through uh, June, uh, we, we were below budget by about $4.8 million. And actually, uh, on a year-to-date number for expenses are in a positive um, uh, uh, positive compared to budget, uh, as opposed to the three and a half million that we were over budget and through February and such. Uh, we anticipate that we will, um, you know, have expenses be uh, over budget by year end as we start to uh, get back into operations. We know that we have to manage our labor component. Uh, that is the one that is going to uh, be the. Uh, it'll be challenging, but at the same time, is the one that we have to flex with our staffing. Uh, you know, based on what our volumes are and such. So we are working on doing that. Uh, and right now, you know, we have a very conservative projection. Uh, you know, uh, for you in our, our financials and everything. But, you know, one of the things, you know, when we talk about unknowns, and we did see this uh, in July, is, you know, through the June timeframe, um, you know, uh, employees, you know, were not taking vacation time. And the reason was, you know, COVID-19. And also, if you wanted to travel to our other parts of the country, they were in shutdown. And, you know, chances are, if you wanted to go stay in a hotel, if they were open, you could stay there, but you had to be quarantined for 14 days. So people were not utilizing vacation time during that time period through June. However, uh, in July, and we're anticipating in August that, in fact, we will see utilization of vacation time and did see it in the month of July. Uh, and we feel that we've captured that in the uh, projections that we gave you because it will lead to decreased uh, revenues compared to budget and such. We just don't yet know the magnitude uh, of the aggregate change uh, for the months of July and August. So with that, Jen, next slide. So when we look at the uh, the growth, this is a slide very similar to the one that Rick pre uh, presented. You know, we do have some uh, pharmaceutical revenue growth, some because of the volume of patients that we're seeing. And you'll see that in the other uh, operating uh, below that we also anticipate some growth in the pharmaceutical revenues in that sector as well. Uh, the aggregate rate increase of 2.3%. Uh, the reason that that is so low is because we have a, a Medi Medicare increase of 0.85%. So when Anna was saying that when you look at our payer mix, that the combined uh, public payers, Medicare and Medicaid is over, over half of our business. When you get low increases from the public payers like we have, uh, it does put a lot of pressure on the margin and also the commercial lift. So 2.3%, as you can see, is uh, going to be is below the the inflation uh, cost for the supplies. Excuse me, the pharmaceutical and the salary and benefits slide you saw before, uh, and that's where the the pressure on, on the uh, the rates come from. Higher collection rate trend. Um, I was the interim CFO two years ago uh, down at CVMC. Um, what I did notice is that there was an opportunity to improve not only the case mix and everything, but documentation and coding overall for Part A and Part B uh, had a ways to go. Uh, it did not um, move a lot uh, during the year that I was not there, but having come back in and such, we will be focusing a lot on revenue to improve the documentation uh, and coding around the Part A and Part B side. Uh, one thing I would like to point out is, as Anna has mentioned, that we will 
be bringing the medical center part of uh, CVMC online to Epic, uh, that the, the VP of Revenue Cycle uh, is now has oversight of the Central Vermont Revenue Cycle. Uh, the person who had it previously uh, moved down south to be closer to family. And we felt it was the right time now to start to consolidate the revenue cycle for Central Vermont uh, into what will become a network-wide revenue cycle. Uh, so as an example, that position uh, is going to be eliminated permanently. We are assessing and uh, planning on how to start to consolidate the CVMC revenue cycle into what will be the network revenue cycle. Uh, and we feel that we'll be able to enhance the performance, you know, through coding documentation and other practices. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, headway made in a short period of time, even around the self-pay collection efforts, which uh, uh, came to, out to be rather confusing and uh, let's say, uh, is, has been streamlined since to make it much more effective. Uh, naturally, we'll have an increase in volume and such. You'll see that in the budget, there's an increase in the physician RVUs. Uh, we anticipate that some of that will lead to increased inpatient activity. Uh, when you look at the budget to budget between 20 and 21, you might look at the inpatient side and say, wow, that's a big increase and such. Um, please keep in mind that for this year in 2020, there was a 3% increase in inpatient activity for this year alone above budget. So that is rolled into the 2021 projection. When we look at the other operating revenues, as was discussed before, uh, the pharmaceutical revenues, 340B, retail pharmacy, uh, contractual, uh, et cetera, et cetera, um, is becoming a more and more important part of hospital budgets because of the fact that the net patient service revenues are no longer sufficient to cover the costs of operations. Um, Central Vermont Medical Center uh, does not necessarily have the full cadre of revenue streams within the pharmacy realm up and running yet. We will be looking to sit there and, and grow and augment uh, what is currently there and stuff, but we did pick up uh, five new uh, contract pharmacy agreements with retail pharmacies for this budget, and they are including that $1.3 million. Uh, and we also have an offset uh, to a uh, let's say a one-time adjustment that was uh, budgeted in 2020 uh, that naturally was not recurring. So that actually had a negative uh, impact to the 2021 budget when it comes to, you know, the other operating revenues. On the non-operating revenue side of things, you know, we're increasing the budget $2.4 million. Uh, it basically will be, in, in, um, you know, driven by our investments and such. Uh, we, uh, despite the COVID-19 negative impact, as a network and even specifically to CVMC uh, have recovered uh, you know, where we were and then some. Uh, so we feel very confident that we'll be able to drive the investment income number, which will drive the total margin for us. Jen, next slide, please. Okay, this is an, an example of the, um, the growth within the pharmaceutical component for CVMC. So on the top box, if you look at all pharmaceuticals, this is basically all inclusive. And you can see starting in, in 2016 that the gross revenue was $25 million. And if we go to the, the 2021, uh, we're out to $57 million. But if you look at the growth within the, the on oncology drugs, okay, uh, the impact of the oncology drugs on the overall gross revenues was about 35%. And when you go across the uh, the page to the uh, 2021 again, it now comprises about 53% of the budget. And if you look at the impact with regard to the uh, the net revenues and such, it, it, it does it has a negative impact with regard to the net revenue less the expense because of the inflation growth of the cost of the drug outpacing the inflation growth of the uh, different payers that are paying for these drugs in a variety of different ways. So this is kind of a, a sleeping or a kind of behind the scenes negative impact to the margin uh, that you don't necessarily see when you just look at cost to cost and revenue to revenue uh, because you have these offsets that happen uh, in the overall picture and stuff. But this is one of the other pressures on the margin as oncology drugs uh, and utilization of these drugs grow and the, the growth in revenue to offset these costs does not occur this does negatively impact the margin. Okay, next slide. So this slide is consistent with the one that Rick had talked before about before. Um, you know, when we look at the eight and a half percent commercial lift that we're looking for, um, we are anticipating a little bit of a negative impact uh, with regard to uh, the impact of COVID-19 on the economy and having people migrate from 
potentially migrate from commercial products to uh, Medicaid or charity care. Um, we have not seen that to date yet. Um, when I, I want to be clear about that, uh, one of the things that we have seen, which is somewhat um, uh, unexpected, is that the stimulus money going to people who have lost their jobs, in some cases, is actually higher than what they were earning when they were working. And so, you know, naturally, uh, they haven't gone to apply for charity care or other things. And the irony of this is so, some people have actually freed up some money to actually have paid some of their self-pay, co-pay, deductibles, et cetera. Uh, we did not anticipate this. As a matter of fact, we anticipated the opposite. What we did anticipate is that the impact would be negative. And we, as a network and everything, pulled back our collection agency efforts uh, starting back in the April timeframe and did not sit there and reinvigorate uh, those efforts until July. Um, so I think we have yet to see what the impact of COVID-19 will be on the economy and how it's going to impact, you know, the growth in Medicaid and charity care uh, versus the uh, commercial uh, product. So we are keeping our eye on that. Uh, the next section down is the breakout of all the different expense areas and the allocation of the uh, revenue lift to those expense areas. Uh, and then, as you can see at the very, very bottom, that, you know, between uh, some of the, uh, let's say, insufficient rates from other payers and what the sustainable number was to offset that, you could see that essentially, you know, they're they're one and the same. So, um, you know, that that basically is the breakdown of the eight and a half percent commercial lift. Okay, next slide, Jen. So here uh, we do have the operating margin of one point two million dollars, or the zero point four seven percent I referenced earlier. A total margin of two point four percent, which is uh, basically uh, including the investment income that I had uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, and as I mentioned before, that we are projecting an operating loss of about four and a half million dollars for this year, uh, some due to the unknown of the last quarter of the year uh, as to how things are going to move uh, with regard to revenues and expenses. As Anna mentioned before, the volumes at, at CVMC can fluctuate dramatically in short periods of time. Uh, and unfortunately, if you have a lot of traveler nurses and such in three month contracts, regardless as to whether the patients are there or not and stuff, we're still paying for them. Uh, so that's why we we actually, when we lose volume, we cannot fluctuate the staff as much as we would like to be able to do that. Uh, however, we did learn through the COVID-19 experience, you know, how we can start to do that on a going forward basis with full time staff. Uh, the salary costs uh, have been stabilized through uh, expense management as a senior leadership team. Uh, we review the uh, FTEs uh, for the organizations every month to make sure that we're not getting uh, over our skis with regard to uh, the labor growth uh, in that area. Uh, we did, in fact, receive $17.3 million in stimulus funds uh, to date, uh, which is uh, used to offset uh, $19.2 uh, million dollars uh, through June. Uh, I don't have the shortfall amount for July yet and everything, but the stimulus funds were close to what we had lost, but didn't necessarily cover them uh, in total. And as I mentioned before, we the, the estimate for the fourth quarter is conservative for the uh, don't know what we don't know, is particularly around vacation time and uh, utilization of that time uh, over the summer, summer months. Jen, next slide. And when the naturally we have uh, financial risks, uh, you know, on a going forward basis and such, uh, we are crossing our fingers that we do not see increase in COVID-19 cases uh, come this fall. But, you know, this is, again, one of the things that is incredibly unpredictable and, uh, you know, uh, very hard to uh, tra trend right now because it's the first time we've seen it. Uh, increased percentage of Medicare, Medicaid payer mix, as I mentioned, if we see a migration of patients from commercial products to Medicaid payer mix and everything, that will add a burden uh, to the organization. Uh, as great as telehealth was for us during COVID-19, and I have to say that I haven't heard a provider not like it yet. Uh, unfortunately, across the country, there were cases of fraud, uh, even at the Medicare level and stuff. So the reimbursement for telehealth uh, is being uh, reviewed by many payers right now to decide what to do with that program. Uh, we're hoping that they look at it as an opportunity for the future um, and continue to go down that path as it provides much better access to a lot of people who live remote that may not have access hospitals, if not for having a telehealth. Uh, 
being that the fear of going to a facility or doctor's office during that time was incredibly high. And so rather than take the, the risk, if you had a cough or what have you, and uh, you didn't want to go to the ED or doctor's office for fear that somebody may have COVID-19, telehealth was a great alternative for those patients and what have you. Naturally, we were working hard on managing the uh, workforce supply and labor costs. Um, you know, as I mentioned, particularly around the travelers, uh, we do have a, a program uh, with the uh, developing LNAs uh, to work for the organization uh, that at the Woodridge uh, Nursing Home uh, for the first time in a long, long time, uh, they did not have any traveling nurses as they hired a lot of the LNAs. Uh, and we're looking to continue to grow that program to address the traveler uh, challenge that we have right now. And as John uh, mentioned early in the presentation, uh, the unknown, not only around the pharmaceutical inflation, but there is noise now in Washington that big pharma is starting to come after contract pharmacy and 340B uh, revenues yet again. Uh, and, you know, the last time they did this, it did result in uh, negative revenues uh, for some organizations. Our medical center took a $9 million hit. Uh, two, maybe two, three years ago. So this is worrisome and stuff with the inflation costs growing the way they are. And now talk of big pharma trying to uh, have the government pull back on some of these revenue programs that are, are key to uh, hospital margins and budgets. And so next page, Jen. Uh, as I mentioned before, the expansion of the LNA to LPN program to grow uh, you know, employees for the organization. You know, Anna can give more color on this when she concludes our presentation, but this has been a very, very positive experience for us. Uh, the assessment of pharmacy revenue programs uh, specifically. Uh, right now, Central Vermont Medical Center does not have a retail pharmacy, uh, so we will be looking at that opportunity uh, as a potential revenue stream for the organization. And as I mentioned before, documentation and coding is we need to get that uh, up and running to a point where after the EPIC implementation, we can then consider putting in the 3M360 that Rick uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, we're nowhere close to being able to do a program uh, implementation of that size at this point in time. And it would actually behoove us to sit there and do a redo of the uh, current coding and documentation on the part A, part B uh, prior to the EPIC implementation and then post EPIC, then go and assess the uh, opportunity for the 3M360. Jen? And with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Anna. Thanks, Todd. So we wanted to just reinforce that um, we are still in the midst of this pandemic, um, but I also wanted to recognize the incredible work that Center Vermont's team, with the support of the network, um, were able to continue to provide the services needed uh, for the community we serve. To date, and this is an incredible good news story, we've had zero positive COVID-19 cases in our Woodridge Nursing Home and Rehabilitation Facility. And that's not by chance. That's, I think, the benefit of having um, a long-term care, skilled nursing facility and rehab center part of an integrated delivery system. So when we were doing PPE training for all of our staff, which we did every half hour, um, uh, for months um, in uh, preparing for uh, the COVID surge. We also did the same thing at Woodridge. And those kind of services um, and that kind of education to the team down there is uh, more challenging in um, uh, skilled nursing facilities that aren't affiliated with um, an integrated delivery system. Additionally, uh, we um, early on in the pandemic at Woodridge, we shut down um, our visitation and we went to screening all staff very early on in March. Again, all of those activities, I think, really served us well. So again, to date, no positive cases of COVID at Woodridge. The PEPE donning and doffing education that I mentioned, we did um, consistently um, for uh, about two months. And so literally everyone that um, touches a patient or goes into a patient room uh, went through that training again, including our surgeons and, and all of our providers. Again, a re-reminder of the importance of those kind of safety measures that really come forward when you're challenged with um, a pandemic. We increased the capacity of negative pressure rooms. Uh, I think when we started, we had under 10, we went up to 27 in total. 
We increased our ICU capacity to, uh, by 128%. And along with the network, we implemented a myriad of protocols um, to support um, COVID-19 airway um, management and code drills. We expand, expanded our ED triage and treatment capacity. Um, and one of the things that was really wonderful to see is we cross-oriented our anesthesiologists and primary care physicians to come into the acute care setting. So our primary care, who were seeing lower volume, even with the use of telemedicine, uh, came into the acute care setting and served as hospitalists, which um, gave us the workforce we needed um, should we have experienced that surge. Same thing with our anesthesiologists. They cross-trained into our emergency department. And like others in the network, we established a pop-up testing site, which we're continuing to um, uh, run seven days a week today. And we also implemented an acute respiratory clinic to separate out patients with respiratory conditions from other patients in our clinic practices. We also continue to have our COVID-19 call center where we triage uh, calls for the community and that's a, a wonderful support to the community as a whole. And we also use that function to uh, test, um, schedule testing and other visits for our clinics. The other thing is, um, as Steve mentioned, we are also a resource for our community. So during the pandemic, when social service agencies required more support, we sent um, resources in to uh, re-educate them on PPE use. Um, we did N95 testing for those facilities. And again, it takes a team effort across the community um, to have the kind of results we've had to date related to COVID prevalence. Uh, we, I believe, are the first in the state to implement thermal scanners to support um, both the acute care setting here. So all of our patients and visitors, when they come in, are scanned for temperatures with a thermal scanner. And what that did for us um, is uh, allowed us to shift staff that we had repurposed during the height of the pandemic to do those temperature screens. We moved those folks back into their primary roles um, uh, and use the thermal scanners to support uh, screening of individuals coming into our acute care facility. Also, all of our employees are screened using the thermal scanner at the employee entrance. And then lastly, I just want to uh, reiterate the amazing community support we had from Central Vermonters. Um, they were with us through all of this, and I can't say enough how grateful we are for all of their efforts um, to support our team um, during the COVID pandemic. Next slide, John. So we are going to share with you um, a moment in time with Jess Sherman. Uh, Jess is a doctoral prepared um, medical surgical nurse um, and she runs our, our med surge unit here and she also uh, led our COVID-19 uh, clinic um, unit uh, here in the acute care setting during the height of the pandemic. So I'll um, let Jen uh, start that video. I've been a nurse for 17 years um, and I've been in various roles, bedside, educator, leader. Um, and this is probably the most stress I've felt in my 17 years of nursing. In the break room, there was a sign that said, um, tough times don't last, tough teams do. And that kind of became our, our mantra, our motto. And they worked through a lot of fear and uncertainty. And I think they were really brave um, and I don't want them to have to do it again, but I know they will. The community was phenomenal. Um, their response was amazing, uh, very supportive. They immediately donated any PPE they had. Um, they made masks. Uh, they even made like little gadgets to put behind your head so that the masks wouldn't be on your ears and, and hurting your ears. But I think the best thing that the community did for us was, um, you know, making sure that they socially isolated and did hand hygiene and wore their masks and they did all the right things. And because of that, we never hit the high COVID surge that we saw in our neighboring states um, and areas around the country. So the community did that and we're really thankful for that. Our organization as a whole came together and did amazing work to create policies and things that we can replicate and, and use again for a surge. Um, what stresses me out is 
a lot of the feelings and the fear that will come back from my team and being able to keep them safe once again. I know that we're going to have a flu season. It's going to be big. It usually is. We're going to be full. Um, and really the COVID surge depends on a lot of um, a lot of people outside of our control. You have a lot of people out there getting bored with the idea of socialization and masking and and I feel like we could have a huge impact if the community doesn't stay on board with this. I can't imagine, you know, the stress and fear level should that actually happen. There's no way to really wrap your head around it and to be in it and it's just scary in its, in its own. <clears throat> Okay, Jen, please just go ahead and, and uh, flip the slide. So I think actually this might be the best uh, point to take a break before we start into uh, Porter. And I would suggest that um, we, we come back in 10 minutes at um, 10.35. Does okay, fantastic. That works. Thank you. Okay, 10.35. Thank you. So we're about a minute away from uh, getting started again. I do see Tom and Robin back on the screen. Um, Jess and Maureen, are you on as well? Yes. Yes. Great. And Sunny, are you, you with us as well? Yes, I'm here. Perfect. Oops. So with that, uh, Mr. Thompson, whenever you're ready, you can take it away. OK, thank you, Chair Mullen. Jen, if you'd just go ahead and flip the slide, that'd be great. All right, thank you. Okay, so thank you, Chair Mullen and board members. We appreciate your service and are pleased to present the Porter Hospital budget proposal for fiscal year 21. Uh, as Dr. Brumstead mentioned in his opening comments, um, my name is Tom Thompson, and since February, I've been privileged to serve as the president and chief operating officer of Porter Medical Center. I was going to mention having uh, served over 30 years in this capacity in community health systems. John mentioned decades. Either way, it makes me feel just a little long in the tooth. Um, but that said, where, where it is relevant is that I have very strong appreciation for the importance of a vibrant healthcare system in its many roles as provider, employer, and community leader. In many ways, an organization's budget represents its priorities. In our presentation, you will witness that our community-focused mission is our priority. By way of introduction, I will comment briefly on our COVID-19 experience to date, the relevance of our organization's financial goal, our emphasis on ensuring and enhancing value and access to care, and the importance of a holistic perspective on our care system specific to our budget's support for our skilled nursing facility, Helen Porter Healthcare and Rehabilitation. COVID-19 readiness is a subject of our recent past, our present and our future as Vermonters and for our entire care system. And so I'd like to start by offering you a snapshot into Porter's experience Addressing COVID's uncertainties has obviously been stressful for all. At Porter, we are proud though of our goal-oriented and adaptive approach, our resilience, our innovation, and our remarkable community support. Uh, starting this spring, we put an incident command structure in place that managed our COVID uh, readiness work through very specific goals, objectives, and milestones. We maintain daily communication with our network peers and other care partners from outside our network to coordinate policies, supplies, people, communications, and patient care priorities. We messaged our teams transparently and with great frequency so that everyone had the most current information. Then as spring slipped into summer, uh, we transitioned with discipline into a safe reopening of our campus and our different care settings as our COVID cases declined. We gained much from this experience and continue to learn as we hardwire process improvements in readiness for a likely wave two experience, as well as a flu season in the coming months. In 2020, as always, the communities we serve have been amongst our greatest assets. Uh, one of our nursing professionals, Mr. John Countryman, 
will speak to this source of strength at the conclusion of our presentation. Serve our community with sustainable financial health is uh, where our organization's overall strategy is grounded that go in that goal. Um, reinforcing the message that adequate financial resources are essential to enable our teams to continuously improve our care and fulfill our mission. Sustainable is a key word in this goal statement, referencing the importance of both stewardship of resources and smart growth, defined as program investments that address priority community needs and which are capital efficient, clinically appropriate, and financially responsible. Our perspective on healthcare reform has a very strong emphasis on value. That commitment to continuously improving value is at the heart of our efforts to be a transforming health system, as is noted in our vision statement at Porter. Uh, we advance this work through priorities that emphasize safety and quality uh, in our care and excellence in our patient and resident experience and doing so at an appropriate cost, community engagement is critical in optimizing this value equation, as is a perspective that our patients aren't just our patients while they're within our four walls. Uh, with that in mind, I'd like to comment on some of the community-based examples of Porter's efforts to support our patients and fulfill our mission programs such as our Patient and Family Advisory Council and our Resident Community Council that involve our patients and our residents purposefully in our program planning and evaluation, providing food support for patients facing food insecurity issues, outreach programs teaching self-care practices to individuals managing chronic disease in their lives, a doubling of food share co-ops, a very innovative program our pharmacy program with an F, uh, serving patients so that they can access fresh and organic foods. And a recent addition, Rides for Wellness, that helps patients with transportation issues get to their important medical and wellness appointments. What it comes down to for us is that access to care is a core driver uh, behind our goal to serve our mission with sustainable financial health. Our organization focuses on primary care with appropriate local access to specialty care and services supported by our UVM health network relationships. Porter's care continuum includes multiple clinic sites and specialties, our acute care hospital and skilled nursing and rehabilitation care serves community residents across their lifetime, enabling us to meet most care needs locally and in a coordinated manner. Our ongoing work to direct our resources in ways that best serve our community is supported by a great team of folks here at Porter, as well as dedicated local governance and medical staff. While today's presentation focuses on the budget for Porter Hospital, we believe that consideration to be inseparable from our support, our, excuse me, from support for our skilled nursing facility Helen Porter Healthcare and Rehabilitation. Helen Porter is a jewel in our care continuum. Its long-term care and post-acute rehabilitation resources enable timely and seamless transitions of care and a safe, high-quality living environment for its patients and residents. Helen Porter is essential to our efforts to enhance value and serve our community. Unfortunately, the payment model for skilled nursing facilities makes financial sustainability challenging. We forecast a nearly $2 million operating loss in fiscal year 2021 for Helen Porter. So a sufficient operating margin for Porter Hospital is vital to maintain this local asset. Uh, Jen Bertrand, to whom I will now cede the presentation, will address this subject further in her comments. On behalf of Porter Medical Center, thank you again for your consideration. Jen? Thank you, Tom. And before I segue into the financial portion of our presentation, I did want to take a moment to thank our community, especially being an administrator that oversees our supply chain. It was an incredible outpouring of support from our community members, from donations of locally produced hand sanitizer uh, to our community members sewing gowns and masks, uh, making face shields, donations of PPE, even local veterinary clinics were contributing um, to our PPE needs. 
uh, donations of food, pizza, coffee, things of that nature. And more importantly, something that really struck home with our workforce were the signs that lined South Street on the way to the hospital. It was just amazing to see the thank yous, um, our healthcare heroes, you rock. I mean, it was just incredible. And it really, truly does mean a lot to our workforce. And we just really do truly want to say thank you. To begin the financial portion of our presentation, we did want to summarize that our request uh, our request and highlight that our FY 2021 budget incorporates the balance of three principles. Number one is to remain dedicated to our patient-centered mission-driven approach. Number two is to ensure continuous investment in initiatives that sustain high quality care. And lastly, ensures stewardship of our resources, which is one of the core values within our organization. I wanted to call out that Porter does continue to remain in compliance with Green Mountain Care Board's budget guidelines. And we did want to point out that we have not incorporated any assumptions for potential future impacts of COVID-19. This is really due to the challenges of projecting future financial performance given the uncertainty associated with a potential second wave. So we've chosen to rely on historical performance indicators to formulate our FY2021 budget. As it pertains to our commercial rate, we have incorporated a 5.75% increase, which I'll explain a bit in further detail in an upcoming slide. Over the last several years, uh, we've strived to reach financial sustainability, and the board's heard me say this over and over again. In order to adequately invest in our workforce, uh, in capital, in our population health initiatives, and services that truly meet the needs of our community and provide, as Tom said, that necessary access to care. This year's proposed budget does provide that baseline funding that we find necessary to deliver the vital health care services that meet the needs of our community. And Jen, if you could go to the next slide, please. To touch on and summarize our uh, net patient revenue and fixed perspective payments that have been incorporated into our budget, our net revenue budget yields a 2.7% increase over the FY2020 budget, which is in accordance with the 3.5% Green Mountain Care Board guideline. And consistent with prior year budget submissions, we have not implemented a price increase this year. As it pertains to our ACO participation, we are currently planning to continue to participate in the Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial programs offered through the ACO. And our submitted budget assumes our FY2020 budgeted estimates simply as a placeholder for other reform and fixed perspective payments. In terms of the risk reserve, our revenue assumptions do not include a reserve for risk. Our current one care projections for calendar year 2019 settlement is yielding a second year of favorable Medicare performance. So considering what is now a hopeful trend, we did not incorporate a reserve for risk. So consequently, the risk reserve remaining at the close of FY 2020 on the balance sheet will be rolled forward into FY 2021. And Jen, if you could forward the slide, please, slide 52. I want to take a moment to talk through our commercial rate, and this slide obviously mirrors what my uh, other counterparts have presented. And as it pertains to our commercial rate, again, we've incorporated a 5.75% rate increase. We have chosen for the fourth year in a row not to incorporate a price increase, as I mentioned earlier. And we really differentiate our negotiated rate with commercial payers separately from price. And this is due to our reimbursement structure with our commercial payers as an increase in price does not necessarily equate to an increase in reimbursement. Over the last three years, we've been able to request lower rates from our commercial insurer partners, and we've been able to find alternative ways to absorb that funding burden. And whether that be through the increase in non-patient related revenues, such as 340B, decreases in expense, or even reductions in margin. The hospital's really been able to shoulder the disparity between true inflationary factors, including the cost shift, as well as the financial and administrative impacts of payer policy changes, excuse me, and what's being passed on to our commercial payers. The latter, the payer policy change, 
um, point, having the result of really diminishing that commercial rate increase that's been approved during the budget process. We cannot continue to sustain that level of contribution that we've provided in the past. And so in order to maintain the minimum consolidated margin needed really as that lifeline support for our nursing home, the hospital can no longer shoulder that lower rate request of our commercial insurers. And just to touch on this slide for a moment, as you can see from the chart, we categorized our rate into three groupings to quantify the 5.75% needed. And I do really want to call attention to the offsets by other payer line, as this incorporates the factors taken into account for cost-based reimbursement, which we do not pass along to our commercial insurers. If you do evaluate this rate requirement as a value of 1%, this year that change in commercial rate is equivalent to $278,000, which is one of the lowest compared to our critical access peers. And in addition to that fact that we've been absorbing the gap in that funding burden, we've also borne the impact of the current inpatient reimbursement structure we have with one of our commercial payers. So for example, with that particular commercial payer, we have a fixed rate of inpatient reimbursement. Therefore, any increase that's recognized will be allocated to hospital-based outpatient services, which then could reflect a higher percentage, however, does yield uh, a lower dollar amount. Uh, Jen, if you could forward to the next slide. We just wanted to touch on the expenses and margin assumptions that were incorporated into our fiscal year 21 budget and managing expense growth with revenue increase. It, it just remains to be a constant challenge year over year, especially when 80 to 85 percent of our total costs are fixed. So also when accounting for that relationship between increases rather than the provider tax, and when we're accounting for inflationary factors, uh, particularly as that pertains to keeping pace with the significant wage pressure facing all healthcare organizations, and like all hospitals in Vermont, Porter's recruitment and retention efforts are challenged by inflationary pressures, wage compression, and workforce availability. And this really does continue to impact that balance between financial viability and adequately supporting the needs of our workforce. And wage increases, as Mark pointed out earlier, comprise approximately 80, 83% of the change in total expense when comparing budget, budget to budget. However, I will say with this budget cycle, we were able to strike a balance between the expense and revenue growth. And this really goes back to supporting our commitment to ensure appropriate stewardship of our resources. To touch on the margin for the, a moment, our budget is yielding a margin of 4.5% for Porter Hospital. With that being said, as Tom mentioned and as we've expressed in the past, this does not account for the hospital's financial support necessary to subsidize our nursing home. So that support essentially diminishes the hospital margin from 4.5% reflected at the hospital level to 2.5% uh, reflected at the consolidated ele level. So it's important when evaluating the hospital's margin to really take this into consideration. And honestly, this support is essential to keep this vital resource in our community. And Helen Porter is an integral part to our uh, population health strategy. And Jen, if you could advance. The next two slides are similar charts to those that my counterparts have presented. Um, and one more, Jen, that just gives the expense breakdown as well. Thank you. And you can see here that the majority of our uh, expense increases are from salaries and fringe. That's really the story for Porter Hospital. And I just wanted to close by expressing that the budget we are presenting is responsible. It remains within Green Mountain Care Board's guidelines. The budget we're proposing allows for that baseline funding that's necessary to build a sustainable future to ensure that we can continue to deliver that high quality patient-centered care that really does meet the needs of our community and achieves our mission, which is to improve the lives of our community one person at a time. And now I'll hand it back to Tom Thompson to discuss our risks and opportunities. Thank you, Jen. I wish to use my closing comments to summarize those select risks and opportunities we'll continue to monitor and address in our fiscal year 2021 budget year and beyond. 
So in the risk column, we'll start with uh, preserving access to care because an ultimate risk of, an in, of inadequate budget resources or performance is reduced access to care. Border Medical Center serves over 100,000 patients and residents annually across its care continuum. A consistently strong margin for Porter Hospital is needed to fulfill our mission across this care continuum's core services. Maintaining competitive compensation is only one of many workforce challenges placing pressure on financial resources. Adequate investment must also be provided to support education and training, equipment, facility improvements, and other resources essential to providing for a safe care and a safe work environment. Porter's access to the EPIC patient record is one of the many advantages of our network relationship. Yet we have to account for our cost share in that investment year over year going forward. As has been mentioned several times now, again, our continued support for Helen Porter Healthcare and Rehabilitation as a key asset is vital to our community. Its efficient operation cannot fully overcome patient sh or payment shortfalls. And so the Helen Porter mission must be subsidized significantly in order for us to maintain that vital resource serving our community. Uh, as Jen stated, the long-term financial impact of COVID-19 is neither known nor addressed in our budget assumptions. Yet it's important to, to uh, acknowledge the real possibility of again facing dramatic operational changes with unfavorable financial ramifications with future disease outbreaks. And I'll close on the risk side with ongoing financial sustainability because continued and escalating margin pressures are very concerning. Uh, we are employing both cost reduction and process improvement strategies to op optimize the resources that we bring to the bedside. Uh, we are concerned about a time when these efforts fail to yield financial results that enable organizational vitality and our ability to continue to adequately address community needs and expectations. Now we are half full, half a cup full people around here. So as we go to the opportunity side, let's start with population health, which is something that makes us all very excited. Uh, one of our physicians, Dr. Natasha Withers, is very involved in this effort across our health network, uh, leading uh, uh, work toward identifying priorities for our organization. This uh, focus is essential to our mission to improve the health of our community one person at a time. Telehealth is obviously also another area of great opportunity. Um, our telemedicine usage reporter exploded this spring from a handful of visits to over a thousand visits in a very short time span when our in-person clinic services were all but shut down. Uh, this resource has also enabled family members to stay connected to loved ones at Helen Porter during the pandemic. Uh, we will capture this opportunity to maintain this momentum in the outpatient setting as well as explore uh, expanded applications within the hospital's four walls, to enhance access as well as quality and safety. Uh, we will also be advocates for long-term payment support for enhanced access to care utilizing telemedicine resources. Our ongoing investment in existing and new services uh, guided by, again, those if the principles of effective stewardship and smart growth is both opportunity and necessity uh, to appropriately address evolving community needs and interests. This work is, is a priority uh, in our strategic plan objectives. EPIC, uh, while EPIC adds to our operating cost, it is also a game-changing enabler of enhanced care coordination and, and, and care improvement across both Porter and with our network affiliates. Our work with Port with Epic, excuse me, presents a, a unique opportunity to dramatically advance value for our patients and community. And I'd like to close with process improvement. Uh, we, we recognize cost reduction is important and always will be important in enhancing value, but we also believe that process improvement holds significant opportunity and represents a much more positive complement to this work. Our focus on improving value at Porter will apply, improve, will, will apply improvement science practices to remove non-value added waste from our work and care processes, yielding an increased percentage of available funds that we can dedicate to fulfilling our mission. 
So I would like to now turn this presentation over by video to John Countryman of our nursing staff. If you wanna go ahead, Jen, and flip the page here. Um, John has served as a team member at Porter on our med surge unit for the past 20 months. As I speak to people about John, they always have, get a smile on their face when they see his passion and dedication for his profession. So thank you again, everyone. It's definitely the, the beginning of this was, was absolutely you know, very stressful for, for everybody. Um, and that stress has, has somewhat decreased over the last few months, but you know, coming back and you know, you have college kids going back to Middlebury and schools possibly starting back up. So you know, the stress level is gonna is gonna start to go right back up and we're hopefully gonna be prepared for whatever comes next. The the initial kind of surge was uh, I would say overwhelming. Um, because it was something that we never really experienced. And even now we're, we're still making changes daily. You know, usually you, you have a patient and you, you understand kind of their diagnosis and exactly how you're gonna treat that and what works and what doesn't. But with COVID, it's, it's not like that. Um, so it's really kind of, a, you know, testing things out, see if they work. If they don't, you try something else. Um, but you're also trying to keep that patient as comfortable and as healthy as possible when you know, they could honestly, they could decline at, at any point and you have to be prepared for that. So um, just being prepared at all times um, on the floor was I think one of the biggest challenges. And we also had a, a floor full of other patients that we also had to, had to care for. So um, it just I think increased the kind of the cohesiveness of the unit, you know, making sure that we were on top of everything um, and just being ready for really anything at any point in time. When COVID first started, it was it was really, um, you know, the unknown. So going into a patient room, you had, you didn't know if, if what you were wearing was going to keep you safe. I would say a lot of people that don't go into the healthcare field, um, you know, you, you go into the hospital, you find out that you're taking care of a patient who is positive or is possibly positive, you know, a lot of people wouldn't be walking into that room. Um, and, you know, the, the nurses, the LNAs, the doctors here, it's, it's, it's really patient first oriented, which is, um, I think, why we were so successful during this and hopefully why we'll continue to be um, in, the, in the case of, you know, more cases. It's nice being in a, in a small community like Millbury. You know, we, we have Porter here, which a lot of the community members really rely on. You know, with the primary care, with the ER, the infusion center, express care, things like that. So it was nice to know that, you know, while they rely on us, you know, on a daily basis, that when we were running low on certain things like masks, hand sanitizer, that we could rely on them. Um, and, you know, they played a huge role in, in making sure that we had adequate masks, hand sanitizer, things like that, making sure that people in the community um, continue to follow the social distancing, you know, guidelines, whether or not you see, you know, Vermont's doing well currently and, and has, and I think it has a lot to do with the fact that, that the people in the community and have been following those guidelines and, and trying to be as careful as possible. Um, but, you know, just because we're not seeing a lot of cases now doesn't mean in the future that we won't. So, you know, stopping those social distancing guidelines and, and, and such, um, is only going to increase our chances of, of having a, another another surge. Well, um, uh, it's a little daunting for me to summarize it at this point. Um, uh, I hope you share my um, admiration. Uh, for the folks that, in the face of all of this, have put these budgets together, um, and uh, particularly the words of uh, Dr. Uh, Gramling and John that we just heard, and um, Jess, um, it certainly, um, I mean, magnified that by 12,000 people. Um, and. I think for those of us uh, in leadership that aren't uh, on the front line, um, that really has been unbelievably uh, inspirational. You know, we are 
not-for-profit um, and um, uh, the ultimate quantifiers, the IRS through their 990 presentations can quantify the benefit that we as community assets uh, give back in community benefit. And for these three organizations, the way that calculates it, it's over $300 million of community benefit year over year over year. But again, I mean, that financial measure just, I think, pales in comparison to what's brought to the table by uh, our people who, even in the face of incredible adversity, have uh, uh, come to the, uh, the fore day in and day out. Next slide, Jen. So um, UVM Health Network in Vermont is uh, a big fish in a relatively small pond, but we are in a pond. We aren't the only um, healthcare uh, delivery organizations. And I think stepping back, uh, we need to um, uh, look at the total picture and that as a healthcare delivery system in the state, um, uh, the financial health has eroded over this four-year time frame. You can see the numbers. The point I want to make here is for the UVM Health Network um, on both sides of Lake Champlain, but today uh, Vermont, we are doing the incredibly hard work of bringing together our clinical systems, uh, first and foremost, our operational systems, uh, and our financial systems to uh, be here to provide uh, access to necessary services uh, for Vermonters. Um, and uh, we're doing everything we can to uh, bring the clinical and financial value out of that uh, intense uh, effort at uh, integration. Next slide. So, um, uh, you know, the whole system in Vermont uh, has these margin challenges. Um, uh, just to reiterate, we certainly uh, see those. Um, COVID-19, uh, I'll come to this in a, uh, more emphasis in a minute, but it ain't over. It just is not over. Um, there is a likelihood of added expense uh, that we cannot anticipate and foregone revenue, hopefully not as dramatic as we've seen in uh, March uh, through June. And I can't, even though we've gotten tremendous benefit from being a network, being collegial, being able to um, work together around PPE and policies, there is a lot of friction in just managing capacity, managing the flow of patients. When you drop one additional uh, factor into it, uh, like COVID, it's hard enough when we have uh, a flu season, uh, but I just need to emphasize that. We've talked a lot about the expense growth outpatient, uh, outpacing revenues, uh, and you know something that's bothered me for a long time, and Todd Keating spoke to this, our reliance on other revenue, um, it's just, uh, anybody that uh, has business acumen, uh, if you drift from your um, core business to uh, make your margin, uh, you feel like you're on thin ice. Um, uh, we absolutely need the uh, commercial rate increases that we've put uh, into the budget, or we will have uh, impacts on access and programs at this point. And, um, uh, there will be payer mix uh, changes that will result in increasing cost shift. The uh, Office of the Actuary uh, in uh, uh, CMS over the next decade sees a two to three percent shift from commercial into Medicare. That will be exacerbated uh, in Vermont because of the aging of our population. So that just gives you a, a order of uh, magnitude. Next slide. So COVID isn't over. And, you know, the anxiety that I spoke 
to before. I know for me personally as a provider, uh, it's less anxiety provoking to do what you're trained to do, which is to dive in and provide that care, even if it's a crisis emergent uh, moment. Um, I've heard people say, well, you didn't see any uh, surge in COVID patients, you just got ready for it. Uh, and again, I mentioned this before, for me, formerly a tip of the spear provider, that would have been more anxiety provoking than actually had we seen a significant uh, surge. So here we sit today, August 24th, and we've got a lot of uncertainty. Um, State of Vermont implemented at the beginning of uh, uh, last week, um, uh, routine screening in skilled nur nursing facilities and um, Helen Porter had an asymptomatic patient come back positive so we have staff quarantined um, and within minutes of uh, literally of Tom Thompson hearing about that he was on the phone with 15 of his colleagues and the innovation that I spoke to before you know, they delivered uh, to him and to the Porter staff not only uh, expertise and uh, backup, but also a playbook on how to uh, to get uh, get through that. Middlebury College, University of Vermont, Champlain College, St. Michael's, those kids are coming back, and there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty uh, in how that's going to go. You've heard about Notre Dame and others that essentially uh, shut down. Um, and uh, North Carolina, I think, is another one. Um, so we have that hanging over us. And, you know, again, back to the impact on our people, uh, which is uh, not to say that not everybody isn't impacted, but I'm just telling you the impact on our people of the uncertainty of the public schools and child care staffing um, has added the stress to the anxiety. Um, and the thing that is just unbelievable to me is that in all of this, I see that resilience, I see that perseverance, I see that uh, innovation. And it just, um, you know, the commitment to serve our communities um, uh, is foundational, it's unwavering, um, and uh, we need the resources to keep doing that, plain uh, and simple. Um, I trust you will uh, give us um, a couple minutes for uh, Jen to go through the next slides, which are images of um, uh, our folks on the front line and some of the expressions of gratitude from our community, which the presidents have all spoken to. And then we'd be happy to take any of your questions. Thank you for that. Uh, back to you, Chair Mullen. Thank you, John. Um, we are going to start uh, deal with each hospital's budgets um, separately. So we are going to start with UVM Burlington. I'm going to turn over the questioning to Board Member Pell. Ready. There we are, I had to unmute myself. Um, before I start with questions, I just also want to thank, you know, the members of your team. Um, Mr. Brumstead is, uh, you know, I went to the flyover at Central Vermont, um, which was a, a very fast, but uh, exhilarating and a uh, sign of appreciation. I've had to um, use the facility in, um, Danny Allen for audiology and my primary care physician here in central Vermont 
and I just uh, and I read Annie Newton's uh, periodic uh, missives come across my screen, and it's clear to me that you know we've had an existential shift in so much in the last months, and that people have uh, uh, risen to the occasion. Um, so I just want to applaud your team um, because this is serious stuff, and uh, I think you've handled it well. Thank um, you. My, first, my first question is uh, having to do with the pro provider tax calculations, and I just want to make sure I kind of understand your your logic behind it. That you know it's a six percent tax, um, and if you look at your 2020 budget, um, it is exactly six percent of the 2019 actual NPR F FPP. Um, the 20 uh, 20 <clears throat> provider tax at 73.6 million is 5.7 percent of the um, the 2019 actual, which seems to me a little low, actually. On the other hand, the 2021 uh, budget tax at 82 million uh, is 6.7 um, percent of the projected lower 2020 NPR FPP and looks a bit high. So um, my question is. Uh, you know, how have you been handling the application of the projections on this tax um, as uh, revenues have changed um, with uh, um, with this pandemic and and uh, the, the changes in NPR F FPP? That might be a general question. Either uh, Mark, you want to start, or Rick, and uh, and just. Um, how you've uh, uh, handled the provider tax calculation for the budget, maybe a mark. Okay. Okay, the first thing that I would say about the provider tax, and we know, Tom, well, we would have to look at the exact calculation and happy to do so, but that's also before the provider tax, I believe, is, is you know, before the application of bad debt and charity. So, you know, there's also an Im impact there on the trend but you know um the provider tax is supposed to be calculated at at the rate of what six percent is of total patient you know revenue and we need to confirm the impact um of charity and bad debt on that so you know we're happy to look into that um the only thing i will say is there is a little bit of delay um, because we need to wait until we get our provider tax bill. So there's like a three, I forget exactly what the delay is, but there's a three to six month lag delay, depending on what the actuals are. But we do always do, you know, try to do our budget based upon that 6% rate. Yeah. Well, my, my, my sense was it might, you might, there might be a little bit of cushion there in 2021, but, uh, uh, the actuals will, t will tell. And, uh, so okay. if, if you, uh, and can provide a little bit more detail that would be helpful yeah we're happy to look at that calculation right because the delta the the difference um between the six percent and the six point seven percent uh is um i think uh, seven or eight million dollars so it's it's serious money um my next question what has to do with the bad debt um <clears throat> the bad debt offsets uh increase in the uvm budget uvm medical center budget uh, for uh, 2020, for um, um, over, for 2021, over 2020 budget and 2020 projection are 25.9 percent and 26.2 percent, respectively. These levels of increase are higher than the system-wide average, uh, which is at 12.3 percent and 17.6 percent, um, which also include UVM. So, for example, Central Vermont's uh, projection is 12.9 percent uh, increase and a negative 5.4 percent, and I, I think some of that might have been explained in the uh, in the presentation. And Porter's is at 17.9 percent and 15.3 percent. So, um, the I'm just curious as to uh, you know why the UVM Medical Center. Um, projection for bad debt would be significantly higher than the system-wide average and the av and, and the amounts projected for Porter and for Central Vermont. You know, so I can I can take that one. I think that's just historically, um, you know, the, the the fact is we have a, we take all comers. I think, um, and we've just had uh, a higher rate. There's nothing. 
I think that's changed in terms of the the rate over the years. Um, uh, and we can we can certainly do a deeper dive in terms of comparing CVPH, I mean, a CVMC importer to us to see what might be driving that. Um, but I think that I think that's just a function of that we we take you know we we're the we're essentially the safety net for the state of Vermont and so we you know we take we take all comers. Okay. And um, Rick, I can add to that too. So you know, Tom, as you think about bad debt and charity, you really or you know when you think about with a trend percent, you need to look at it as say a trend percent as a total percentage of gross revenue. Um, and, you know, the medical center's percent of total gross revenue was 1.76% in 2018. It was virtually the exact same percentage, 1.76% in 2019. And in the 2021 budget, there was probably a favorable trend when we put that, you know, budget together. And, you know, this is what we're talking about that we put these budgets together before we know what the total year impact is. And there's a lot of things that hit these, hits the payer changes, but you know, there are payer changes well, from the time that we submit the budget. So, so in the FY20 budget, that percent is 1.56%. We saw the trend increase a little bit in FY20. Uh, 2020 through January to 1.9%, acknowledging that FY20 is a very unusual year and it's difficult to draw a trend to, but that rate in the FY21 budget is 1.78% of growth, the exact same no number or very close to the exact same number of 2018 or 2019, and acknowledging that you know every 0.01% or 0.1% um, on the medical center is not an insignificant, you know, an insignificant number. But that trend in FY21 is appearing to be right in line in, with 2018 actual and 2019 as a percentage of total gross revenue. Okay, well, th thank you for that. I can go back and look and you know, yep. see from your your uh, income statements. Uh, look, look for look for that. Um, my next question has to do with the epic offsets. Um, in December, the medical center submitted an updated cost profile for the Vermont hospitals in Champlain Valley, profiling a total of 43.5 million in offsets, with 27.1 accruing to UVM Medical Center, 4.3 million to Central Vermont, and 2.7 million to Porter. Um, the profile projected UVM and, and Medical Center, Central Vermont, and Porter staffing and legacy system offsets over fiscal years 2020 in 2021 at 5.4 uh, million and 12.3 uh, million respectively. So my question is, is are those projected savings, those offsets, you know, still on track um, with the December uh, submission or, um, or have things changed? And, and where, if they haven't changed, where are they embedded in, in, in your balance sheet or income statement? So do you want to take the first? I can take the second question, Mark. Uh, I don't know if you want to take the first one there. Well, um, I mean, I think Tom, I think, I think what I would say as it relates to Epic, is we submit updates on our Epic project twice a year in accordance with the CON, and um, and and answering a specific question on a specific year is a little more challenging because it needs to be put in context with what the total budget is for epic as of you know right now i think all of our forecasts for the total project are still projected to be in line you know with budget but you know we would have to take a look back and you know we would prefer well, to reference with a question um, in the manner of how it relates to those twice a year updates. And I believe that we just well, submitted one back in July. So um, happy to follow up on that you know, question, but I think that we mean it, well, we need to manage that question in the context of the total budget um, and the CON approval versus a specific year. 
That's absolutely correct. And um, we do um, uh, put in the regular reports and there's been a lot of rigor since it's part of the CON to track back to what the two types of offsets are. There's offsets that um, are people related where uh, honestly we're a little bit behind because of timing issues and there are offsets related to the fact that we can sunset specific applications, licensing fees and those. And from the last report that I saw, we're actually ahead uh, there. But to Mark's point, uh, and we can do this, uh, Tom, we can true that up against this budget, but this is something that we're tracking sort of from the beginning of the project uh, to the end. And when you sum those two, we're pretty much on track, but we have a lot of work to do. And obviously our board of trustees, and I see John Dwyer, chair of our finance committee, uh, they're very much focused on oversight, on uh, making sure that we get those uh, those expense offsets. What I thought I heard Mark say is, uh, is that we might, the group, the board might have an updated um, uh, profile, budget profile, um, you know, through July. The last one I looked at was December. And so um, did I hear it right that, that we do have an updated budget profile? Um, I believe that we submit one in July. So, you know, um, I know Eric Miller is on the line listening in too, but, but I think we're supposed to submit the through June and that information is available the end of July. So if it isn't submitted, Tom, it is, it is, um, coming it. very soon. Yeah. So, yeah. but, um, I can follow up on that and we know we can get you the most current report on that. Tom, yeah. this is Eric Miller. We did submit a, a July report that should be available to you, and it has updated numbers on both the staffing offsets and the system offsets that John mentioned. Great, great. I, I had asked our, our folks on CON, and what the one they sent me was a December one. So that was the basis for my question, assuming that that was the mo most recent one we had. Uh, my next question is on in the narrative, um, <clears throat> the uh, – the uh, on page 16, um, there there notes of projected one, and this was also in your slides that you presented a 1.7 percent quote increase in patients, and on page 17 cites a 54 million quote increase in staff and provider FTEs for increased patient volume, and I'm just wondering if those two uh, statements on page 16 and 17 are aligned. It, it is the 1.7% increase in patients equal to 54 million increase in, you know, as part of your uh, increased uh, $125 million um, e expense increase? Uh, so for the most part, yeah, they are aligned. I think some of those FTE increases like uh, we put in our slides today is not just based on patient volume increases. Some of that was related to our outpatient pharmacy uh, increase um, as well. Um, so we had about 22 FTEs related to that. That's not patient related uh, revenue, but in general, um, absolutely. The, the increases in the total number of patients and aggregate volume coming into the medical center, that's that's really the key thing that we've, you know, that's, that's the, in terms of an expense management perspective, aligning, you know, we're obviously a very um, labor intensive um, industry and aligning that um, that volume and that revenue with uh, with with staffing is is something that they're definitely uh, they're definitely linked. Yeah, I, I noticed as we went through the slide that the fifty four million dollar number wasn't there. It was kind of a different calculation, but close to fifty four million. And I just wanted to know whether the 1.7 percent increase in volume had a rough relationship to the 54 million yeah i think that 54 million i think we broke it out a little bit differently in the presentation today i think that 54 million is a combination of both the inflation and so the salary inflation and the right. FTE increases right because uh, what was in the slide for salaries it looked like 48 million so there's like a and probably so what i'm hearing you're saying is like six million dollar embedded in inflation as well 
Okay. Um, regarding the psychiatric beds, um, I think the last quarter report we had received was uh, last February. And um, as I recall, there was a balance in that, I call it a counter reserve of around $20 million. And so my, my question is, is the work that was done up through February, is that in any way gone scale, stale and will have to be replicated once this project picks up some steam again? Or, um, uh, or is it, you know, not, or it won't be scale, stale? And, um, and if not, when do you think that we can begin to pick up this project again? There seems to be, uh, and maybe I'm confused by the question. Let me just pick up the project again depends on our financial health and our ability to make capital investments to cover that. Um, as we've talked ad nauseum, the $20 million that, um, you know, uh, we certainly have uh, the cash capacity to, uh, uh, to cover that piece is a tiny piece of doing a project of that magnitude. And everything, um, uh, as we've spoken to, with our current, even pre-COVID financial situation, uh, we're really squeezed down on capital to maintain our liquidity. And the thought of, even though it's incredibly important and necessary, that we would be um, going forward with that uh, psych hospital on the Central Vermont campus, We've got to get back to where the ship is uh, is righted, and we're not talking about reducing access to core programs. Um, and so, I, I don't know if there's a specific report that Mark or Rick uh, or somebody supplies to the Green Mountain Care Board pertaining to that twenty million dollars that we committed uh, several years ago that you're referring to, uh, Tom, but. Um, uh, that's where, in my mind, the project is critically important, but on hold until we have the financial wherewithal to uh, uh, to be able to support it. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, I'd have to go back and check, but I think that the board order having to do with that $21 million said that at some point, if this project wasn't going to go forward, that that would um, be committed to rate reduction. So there was a tag on it. It wasn't, a, um, I think, I'd have to go back and look, but I recall looking at it a couple of times uh, in the near past, and, and that language was there. So, I mean, to me, it's it's money that's in a reserve somewhere uh, at the medical center, you know, for um, uh, additional 25 to 30 psychiatric beds. And um, um, if at some point you folks decide that this isn't going to go forward, uh, we should figure out what to do about that $20 million. The um, next, my next question is having to do with Fannie Allen. So uh, regarding the difficulties of Fannie Allen with the fumes, do you, I didn't see any kind of segregation of those lost revenues and increased costs associated with that in, in the narrative or in the slides. Uh, do you have any kind of segregated view of the impact, because I would think it would be a one-time impact of lost revenues uh, at Fallon, Fannie Allen and uh, any increased costs uh, associated with that fume problem. So, so the impact was really built into our projection. Uh, so when we uh, when we were talking about how January was not, you know, already was um, a struggle for us financially, a, a, a chunk of that was the fact that we had to shut down uh, Fannie Allen for a period of time. So it's certainly the impact of that now um, is is in our projection. It's not in the 21 budget because we're, we're anticipating those operating rooms to be um, right. obviously fully operational. They're already, you know, there. So it's in there. It's obviously with all that COVID, you know, impact that's in that projection as well. It's um, it's embedded in there. We could certainly break that out um, if that would be helpful, but that's that's where it is. Well, I, I just, you know, I just view it as kind of a one-time uh, revenue loss and expense. And, and uh, so probably in comparing 2020 budget to um, 20 budget, um, it would, 
it would probably wash out. But if if you had any separate accounting having to do with you know the incidents of Fannie Allen, it would just be helpful to understand what the magnitude of that was. Um, my next question has to do with uh, my favorite subject. Um, that last week uh, in their 2021 budget narrative, uh, DIVA announced, quote, and I'm quoting, in 2021, DIVA will be level funding rates that do not have a federally mandated rule for increase such as FQHC services. Um, so I'm wondering if that, uh, I, and I noticed in your payer mix that your expectation in 2021 having to do with Medicaid revenues was a reduction of 3.1% even before this notice, which is 4 .2, was $4.2 million. So does that um, directive or statement by DIVA affect your estimate on um, uh, Medicaid revenues in 2021? So the, yeah, the assumption that we have in there was just obviously before that came out, um, we would have to take a look to see if that would have any impact on us uh, going forward. This is another one of those examples that, you know, we're building the budgets, you know, quite a bit in advance of when the this, yeah. the, this year starts. We even, I think I shared a, a few weeks ago, it looks like Medicare as well, um, getting to, I think, what Todd had mentioned in terms of pharmaceutical companies kind of getting back into that 340B space, it looks like outpatient Medicare rates might be going down as well, which we haven't accounted for in our budget. So we'd have to take a look to see uh, what impact that that might have on what, we, what we've submitted. And so my, la my last question has to do with uh, what I think we all feel is a rock and a hard place, which is this cost shift. Um, I, you know, as I went through your materials and submissions, it almost seemed to me like the cost shift is kind of uh, the default that uh, you know, Medicaid and Medicare, but Medicaid especially can underfund, and it's just supposed to be uh, a kind of transfer to commercial insurers. Um, and we just went through a rate review process and we got over a thousand comments and letters from people saying they can't afford their premiums and they can't afford their uh, co-pays and deductibles. And so that's the rock and the hard place. Um, my feeling and is is that UVM is the least affected by the cost shift because you have a 61% plus or minus um, uh, commercial share where a lot some hospitals are down below you know 50% and so it's a struggle for them to 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 uh, you know, balance their revenue streams um, and if if you look at this year. The increase request in NPR, the 3.3% increase in NPR, is uh, 89.8 million, and 76.8 of that is 80 uh, or 85% is the UVM Medical Center. So you do have more flexibility to cost shift than um, than uh, the other hospitals. If you take UVM out of the mix and just look at the 13 remaining hospitals, their requested NPR increase for 2021 is simply nine tenths of one percent. So, um, you know, you know, last year when I didn't vote for the UVM budget, I did say that I, I, you know, I don't cite the above kind of numbers that I just went through as criticizing UVM. You're just following the rules that are before you and simply pursuing avail available opportunities. But I, I, I also feel that this cost shift thing is a calamity. Um, at some point in time. When we we're at the Rutland hearing for Rutland Medical Center, we asked the CFO, or I asked the CFO, 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 CFO um, uh, you know, when was, when, it, when, when do we reach the breaking point relative to the cost shift? And she said, we've hit it. Um, and uh, you can look at, you know, the operating margins even pre-COVID for six or seven of Vermont's hospitals, you know, and they've been in, in the red for multiple years. So um, I know last, a year in Middlebury, I, I asked um, uh, President Brumstead about this, and his response was one that I agree with, which is we fix the cost shift through value-based payments um, and, uh, and, and the fixed prospective payment system, which makes sense to me. But my, so my, but my question is, um, you know, looking forward, and especially given UVM's uh, uh, scale in, 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 in healthcare in Vermont, and the fact that they have a strong hand in, um, of 50% ownership of the ACO, which is where 
the uh, fixed prospective payment and value-based system is trying to be transformed is looking down the road. Um, do we, is there any expectations that, that we can address this cost shift or at least in a united way, go back to the legislature, you know, and the governor and say, you know, the, these cost shifts uh, have to be covered more substantially. I mean, if you look at the FIBA's budgets over the last three or four years as the economy has grown, you know, they've been under budget quite a bit. Um, I don't, uh, uh, so there is some opportunity there. Um, there's some auto reports that Doug Hoffer's done that show some inefficiencies in Medicaid. Um, there are opportunities for us to kind of work collectively to um, unwind the cost shift as much as possible. Because, you know, I, I don't want to be a cost shift enabler as, as a board member. I. I, I, I empathize with those thousand people that sent us comments and sent us letters. And I also empathize the situation you are in and your fellow hospital folks are in by saying the commercial uh, uh, rate payer is the only place to go to, to balance the books. So I'm just, I'm just asking for your, um, you know, your thoughts now about where we go relative to um, um, bringing the, the cost shift to a soft landing. Uh, there's uh, um, a lot uh, in those comments uh, and that uh, question, just sort of looking at our experience, um, the, uh, there's been a divergence since 2015, 2016 in the premium increases by commercial payers and the uh, um, granting of commercial rates uh, to the hospitals. So there is obviously utilization in that. There is uh, a lot of, um, uh, at least in our calculations, pharmaceutical, but there's been a, um, a separation, a lack of correlation between the um, uh, sub-inflationary increases uh, granted to our hospitals um, and the, the premium growth. The second thing I would say is, you know, when we signed up for the uh, Vermont Next Generation Program, um, we, our expectation was um, that CMS uh, would be true to what they um, said uh, the deal was. I live by a deal's a deal, and we were supposed to get 20 basis points less than what uh, Medicare Advantage was given uh, for increases, and we haven't come anywhere close to that. And if we had done that and had just minimal Met Vermont Medicaid increases, there would have been significant ability to do what I said we should have been doing, uh, Tom, and that's to take those dollars, and that would have relieved rate pressure from uh, from uh, the commercials. We still have fiscal 21 and 22 to hold CMS, CMS, CMMI's feet to the fire to provide those uh, those uh, increases into the model. And that's what I said. I believed that right when we crafted this uh, approach, that that was um, one of the only ways that we were going to come back at the cost shift was to, um, uh, I think, more fully fund Medicare. And this seemed like a pathway to do that. I think, Rick, you wanted to say something and maybe Mark. You know, just just a comment about the 61% and the fact that maybe we have a little bit more ability to absorb this issue. I think I think the reason why that number and I assume Tom, you're looking at net uh, patient revenue when you're uh, when you're when you're taking a look at that number. The fact is, I mean, it's at that rate because of the reimbursement rates on all the on all the other you know, all the other lines of business. So the you know the bad debt, the charity, and also going back to the, the slide that Steve showed. All the all the tertiary care that we provide, all those services that are provided at a loss here, because we are, you know, the academic medical center for the region, is really what pushes that number to that, you know, to that level. That 
I would contend we actually have less ability or less flexibility, um, and it's at that level because of all of that, um, that the impact of, the, uh, of, of being an academic uh, medical center. I'd like to add to what Rick said that if you think about Vermonters who need to get tertiary care and payers who need to pay for it, um, if we don't have that capacity and ability provided in Vermont, I assume the care is still going to happen. You're just the payers, whether it's Blue Cross or MVP or Medicare, Medicaid is going to pay out of state providers to do that work. You lose provider tax on that, plus you lose the ability for people to stay close to home to get the academic tertiary care they need. So I, I see if the care is still going to happen, we need to be able to have a way to provide it in Vermont. Well, I, I appreciate those answers. I, I just, um, and I think we are between a rock and a hard place. I don't have a simple solution to this either. I know that my experience is, you know, in the fifth floor in terms of the state budget that, uh, you know, uh, you know, I'm a dark hat in some quarters because for nine years we kept that budget, uh, transportation fund, general fund budget growing at under 3%. And it's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a very hard thing to do. But I also think that this cost shift, as, as the um, CFO and Rutland said, is at the breaking point. And, and um, if the feds aren't going to address it, at least maybe we can address it at the state level in terms of, of not getting the kinds of uh, notices that we got from DIVA last week that says there's not going to be a rate increase in 2021. So, uh, uh, thank you. Those, hello, Tom. This is hard. Tom, um, I would just like to follow up on a couple points, and we know we don't need to go through it now, but I think it's important when we're talking about the cost shift um, that we put the percentages in there on slide 83, I believe, and 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 when we think about this we really need to put it in the context of these three categories because there is point and we know I think this deserves more conversation um, and you know but I think the reality is is when you know the burden of the cost shift these last three or four years when you take a look at the commercial rate increases provided to the hospitals is that burden of the cost shift has been put on the hospitals the last three or four years candidly and there is some correlation to the deteriorating margin you know margin performance well because of that and i would say that we're beyond the breaking point actually and that's why we're so adamant about this is why we need this commercial you know rate increase to to um to stay sustainability but i believe the percentage you are looking at and you know keep in mind depending on what data set you look at the percentage might be off a percent or two is you know that 59.7 percent on the medical center side so you know um you need to put that in context with the payer mix of how are the services provided up above which is 36 percent and it trends with the other two hospitals at 31 and 37 percent and i think we all need to be very very careful when comparing that 59 percent 0.7 for the medical center as a mix of uh payments to the 46 percent to the 52 percent of porter that has while that has some correlation to the cost shift, that doesn't mean the medical center is doing better on the cost shift. I would argue, at least for our three hospitals, and we should take a look at this, that they're doing worse. Because if you look at the cost coverage down below in the most simplistic manner, that, you know, um, of their payment, you know, rate, you know, that's only covering 60% of the cost where the comparable hospitals on our side, and this is something we should look at for all of the hospitals, but this is a complicated conversation. We can't, we need to be very careful in just picking a single metric um, to draw conclusions on. We really need to put it in the balance of all of this, but I would suspect that if you did the true cost shift from a, from a, a dollar's not covered by cost at the medical center that it's probably the largest cost shift in the state particularly because they 
are the only ones that provide certain high-end services, which Medicare and Medicaid patients utilize that s services the most. So, you know, I acknowledge the 59 or 60 percent that you call out as a percent of net. That is what the trend is. But we need to be very, very careful on how we relate that to draw on conclusions, because I would argue, but happy to have a conversation, happy to go through the numbers, that the cost shift is actually the greatest at the medical center compared to all of the other hospitals. And then the other thing well, that I want to say, Tom, is that um, while the others were responded, I took a look at the provider tax. It is after bad debt and charity. And um, it, it looks like the calculation in the 21 budget for the medical center is 5.76%. And I would just say, make sure when you do your calculation that includes net patient service revenue and FPP, because when you do it on that calculation, it looked like it was pretty consistent over the years. But you know, we will still follow up on those numbers. And if it's inconsistent with what you're seeing, you know, let us know and we'll go through the discussion with the staff. No, I, I'll be glad to have the conversation as we go through this. Um, one thing I'm, I might say is I fully agree with you that the cost shift is complicated, but so wasn't property tax reform. And we had the Brigham decision and, and, and within, you know, that Brigham decision happened in February 15th. And by June, we had Act 60. I think Act 60 was a good thing in terms of leveling the playing field, uh, using the property tax to level the playing field. I think income sensitivity and over-aggressive income sensitivity kind of screwed that up a bit. But but there are ways to solve these problems. And uh, um, the, uh, to me, the cost shift is one that's running into a brick wall in a, in a, in a very short period of time. But I'll thank you and, and, and turn, turn the mic over to my fellow board members. Thank you, Tom. At this point, we're going to move to board member Yusufer. Maureen. Uh, thanks. Um, first, thank you for your presentation. And I truly do appreciate all you've done and all you're doing during this crisis. Um, as you've mentioned, we all need to balance affordability. And we need to balance that with quality and access to care. In addition to that equation, the financial long-term sustainability is important. And those are some of the things that you brought up. But under affordability, one of the challenges is the patient's decisions to seek care or not. And that's based on the cost to them, which is driven by high premiums, co-pays, and deductions. So we certainly do have a lot to balance here when, when we look at um, some of the things that we're, we're confronting. So one of the things I always ask you about each year is cost savings. And what we've heard in the past is, um, you know, the low-hanging fruit is gone and, and uh, you know, you've already you already have assumed cost savings in your numbers. But I'd like to talk about some of the projects that you brought up last year and what progress you've made. And I know obviously COVID happened, you know, mid-year between when we last met a year ago in, in August. And so you had probably about six months of work on that and then COVID hit and I'm sure, you know, things were put by the wayside. But what progress have you made on the centralized shared services for HR, IT, marketing, and communication, uh, communication? And can you address the timing and projected savings of when you'll be able to implement something in that area? Um, we've worked hard on uh, shared services um, um, in all of those areas uh, and um, uh, implementing uh, concrete uh, plans uh, around uh, HR, uh, IT, general counsel's office uh, is uh, centralized. Um, the big move uh, from uh, 19 to 20 to 21 um, is um, actually a budgetary move, and Mark, you might speak to this, and that's to um, and this is where it gets really complicated to do this kind of integration, to take all of the expense for HR and to identify that in all of the affiliate organizations and put that in one place under one leader co-managed with the presidents of the organizations so that we can start to find those uh, efficiencies. And we do have a methodology to share the cost. Mark, you can speak to the big step that we uh, took in 2020 
to really sort of consolidate those shared service costs. So I think, Maureen, I would say that we're in the middle of that process. Oh, oh, okay. So I think to John's point is that we've identified all of the shared service structures across the whole health network, all of the affiliate organizations. We have a, a monthly report on how those um, shared services are doing to plan. Now we're in the process in FY20 one is creating with a leadership structure over multiple organizations on how we go through the decision process well to mine those savings i mean um, um our process is built on the total health network we have hospitals in the state of vermont we have hospitals in the state of new york so and also that process is highly linked with the leveraging technology okay so i think we have two or three more affiliates to come up on 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 a single gl platform or premier connect because you know technology is the key in reporting consistency so i think next year we're going to have all of the affiliates on premier connect we are migrating all of the affiliates to the same payroll system workday we're in the middle of that and epic is another is another big one but in fy21 it is building those leadership structures on how it goes across organizations because we've established all of the reporting structures for it from a numbers perspective um and in fy22 and fy23 that's where it presents the real opportunity um that we realize will the return on these investments that we're making or from a technology perspective and you know keep in mind also too is as we navigate how we build a more efficient structure for the health network um there are certain employment arrangements and um that we need to be sensitive at different affiliates and within different states so that's why the importance of creating with that leadership oversight structure in fy21 is going to be fundamental to um how we yield those savings in 22 and 23. So, you know, we're still in the middle of it, but all of our investments from a system perspective and from an internal reporting perspective, I can tell you that every cost center within the health network is mapped to what we call a functional area now. Um, so, you know, from a reporting perspective, you know, we just barely got there in um, end of FY19, 2020, and we refined it in FY21 to what John was talking about. But we still have another year, I think, or two until we can, you know, really mine those um, savings. And Epic's going to take us a long way there. And I think that's due to be fully implemented now in another 18 months or so. Okay. So I definitely look forward to seeing those incorporated into your commercial rate ask schedules and instead of seeing you know then the need continually for a baseline six percent that um you know that's offset by several percentage for some of these cost saving you know opportunities um the, ne the next one that you had brought up before was um integrating services like pharmacy and supply chain um, you know, can you talk there about any vision timing and projected savings um, in that area? So, Maureen, this is Todd Keating. So, with regard to supply chain, um, Mark just mentioned a variety of different systems we're putting in place, and the Premier Connect system is the supply chain and accounts payable function. So we're just at the final stage of getting that implemented across the network. So during 2021, we will be planning on the final steps to consolidate the supply chain function, not only with regard to the purchasing organization, which we've done to your reference on the low hanging fruit, but now it's the finishing touches on logistics and staffing at each location, at which time that project will be brought to completion. Charlie Michelli, who's our VP of uh, supply chain, is actually working on that plan uh, as we speak, and he said he'll have it to me very shortly. Uh, so that will be one that we'll be able to give you a lot more detail on next year and how it was rolled into the budget. With regard to the pharmacy, that's in its infancy right now. Um, you know, we do have uh, the operations people working uh, to come up with a network strategy and philosophy with regard to a network-wide uh, pharmacy. So that is in process with regard to the planning phase and identifying the opportunities right now. So supply chain will be much farther ahead of that. 
Um, I want to touch on some things that Anna and I are working on at Central Vermont Medical Center. In order for a lot of these shared services, and I'll, I'll say specifically the ones I'm responsible for, which are supply chain, revenue cycle, and finance, we have to have the, the IT platforms in place. And the good news is that uh, in advance of having to put Epic in at all the locations, the prerequisite was that you have to have Premier Connect, Workday, and these other systems in place. So we're getting to the point now where we can actually start to consolidate the finance functions, the revenue cycle functions as these systems go in. And Anna and I are already working on plans for supply chain, finance, and revenue cycle at Central Vermont Medical Center. And you'll start to see that in a conversation of the budget for CVMC next year as well. So, um, you know, as Epic gets installed, then we can finish the revenue cycle work. And to the question earlier about the timing of the savings, it's not until we get the system in place that we can actually start to eliminate positions and other vendor support, et cetera, et cetera. So we're on our way. It's just going a little bit slower than anticipated. Okay. Um, and unfortunately, COVID did force many decisions, including expense cuts, to try and preserve your capital and, and minimize losses. And what have you learned from these expense cuts? And are there any that can carry forward in future years uh, or alternate um, ways to provide service, such as telemedicine, which I, I know you address somewhat, but you know, are there are there ways that this can you know help bring some efficiencies um, that maybe you didn't really realize were there, but you know, because of the unfortunate COVID situation where you had to dig under every rock, that that maybe some of these could survive and just wanted to to touch on that a little bit. I'll let the CFO speak to any uh, specific uh, areas, but um, you know, unfortunately, uh, we went through a rapid and dramatic downturn that required uh, furloughing uh, many employees. And I know the CFOs have been laser focused on bringing back those employees as the uh, need has arisen and it's been spoken to throughout the, the presentations. There's a very rigorous uh, process at each one of our organizations to review every single FTE that's added and um, CFOs jump in here, but uh, I believe as we've sort of unwound the furloughing, the same process uh, is going, Rick, you can speak to the process at the medical center uh, specifically. Yeah, we, I mean, we, we, obviously FTEs are the key, uh, you know, expense driver in, a, in our organization. And even before COVID hit, you know, with the finances the way they were in December, you know, we implemented a position uh, management review committee that every week, actually, I missed it this morning. So hopefully they didn't approve too many positions while I was, uh, <laughs> while I was away, but um, that essentially is just keeping, you know, trying to keep, again, the volume with, you know, in line with the FTE growth. And certainly COVID kind of caused a reset uh, to that when we had to not only furlough employees, but, you know, reduce hours and change shifts and that sort of, that sort of thing. So, you know, as we've been kind of ramping back up, just making sure that that stays in line is what that position management, you know, uh, group uh, does. And then I, just to add on the technology piece, I think I mentioned this last year as well. I think, you know, the the the, the key is, and it's been mentioned a few times, is really that, you know, to, to, to have an impact on, on FTEs, we do need the systems. And I think I talked last year about the, uh, the artificial intelligence system that we had started to kind of look into, which, you know, is starting to kind of, we had to put a pause on it uh, because of COVID, but that's starting to kind of ramp up that 3M 360 product that um, I mentioned a little earlier, right now that process in terms of documentation has this back and forth between the provider and the coder, which that would almost pretty much eliminate that because the system actually cues the provider while they're in the record on something that they might have missed in, in their documentation. So I think, you know, technology is certainly the, the key uh, to, you know, after you've done the hard work of ensuring that FTEs are not growing beyond what your, you know, the, the volumes that you need to, to support um, all of the systems that we have in place is where we'll extract the rest of the, the savings. And um, Maureen, the one other thing I would add is that if you look at where we saved most of the money 
when COVID really impacted us, we, you know, we furloughed about 660 employees. They were mostly, the far majority were care providers. It's because we weren't doing outpatient surgery, elective care, our ambulatory care spaces, things like that. We've gotten most all of that group back to work. So we still do have some furloughs, but the, I mean, the reason we were able to really drive down expenses is we, we weren't providing as much care, to be honest. And through, you've heard through the whole presentation that labor is a major driver of cost to the system. Okay. Maureen, then, um, this, this, this is Todd, just real quick. So as Steve was talking about the COVID uh, impact on the clinical side. There also was one on the administrative, you know, let's say the shared service side as well, with regard to a lot of uh, employees started working from home because they were afraid of the infection and coming to work and potentially getting it. And what we found was we actually could function very well at a high level with uh, employees working from home. It's not to say that there weren't bumps and bruises along the process of learning how to do it, what have you. So the question now becomes, are we able to uh, incorporate that as part of our culture and shrink our footprint with regard to space that we occupy right now and stuff, which, which you know, heat, light, utilities, you know, the whole nine yards on top of the rental expense, so that we could actually hotel employees when they want to go into the office and stuff, but yet would be able to work from home as well. So, you know, that is a project that we tried six years ago, but connectivity was a big problem, but the software and a lot of other things have improved dramatically. So we will be looking at that as a way to shrink our overhead, which is something that you have to you, you have to make, you know, it's not much of an argument that it's unproductive cost, right? I mean, overhead is, is something that uh, as long as you get the product you need to make decisions off of and stuff, um, you know, the overhead space itself and everything's not that important. Yeah. Okay. And then beyond cost savings, I mean, you know, the other, you know, things businesses will look at, right, is is other uh, other revenue growth. And I understand it's, it could be out of your comfort zone, as as Dr. Brumstead brought up um, with the, uh, you know, kind of outpatient pharmacy. But when I look at what you're doing with the outpatient pharmacy and what you're saying, it's from what I'm reading in, in your backup, it's delivering about $9 million, it seems like, to the bottom line. It's $40 million of, of revenue, and there obviously were expenses in there. And, and that's 25% of your $40 million for, for UVM next year. So um, I, you know, I almost want to flip the conversation to say, you know, assuming that that's beneficial for the patients and, and, and you know, not a cost increase for patients or, you know, what other opportunities are there to drive in, whether it's other operating revenue or non-operating revenue, because it's, you know, it is harder and harder to to make the margins that you need to, it's hard to rely just just on you know commercial, which I know you don't just rely on commercial, but that tends to be kind of the math when you're solving the end at the end of the day, you know how, how do you get to the bottom line? So, you know, I would just challenge you to say what else is out there, and is there anything else that can help help add to your bottom line and help offset you know direct ex, you know revenue from payers from you know commercial in particular. So I don't know if you have an answer for that, but I, I would just say, and I, I do understand it's out of comfort zone, but, you know, you, you look at it, everybody's looking for different revenue streams, and sometimes you find some that are, are profitable, and and um, I don't look at that as a negative. I mean, I, I look at that as as just helping helping the bottom line. Frequently, you those Maureen. opportunities, Maureen, uh, require significant scale, and uh, uh, our leadership team uh, meets uh, regularly with the leadership team of Maine Health and Dartmouth Hitchcock, and we're actively seeking those types of opportunities that we can capture together. Okay. Um, and pre-COVID, I think all three hospitals were were running in the in the red um, bottom line, which which was far off the projections that were. Uh, that you were forecasting. Uh, some of it was top line related, some of it was higher expenses. So, you know, one of the things that it, I guess it also potentially could be, could be was leading to was the EPIC um, implementation. And I guess, can you talk a little bit about, you know, how the training went, the rollout, you know, discuss any issues you encountered, including lost productivity with the revenue cycle and things like that, and, and was part of this due to EPIC uh, maybe, you know, beyond what you thought. I mean, it's a huge implementation, and I know you tried to plan for some downside. Um, was that enough? 
you know, was it epic or what, what, what was the cause of why you were falling so short across all three hospitals prior to COVID? So I, I can speak for the UVM Medical Center. So a big piece was the, you know, the, the shutdown of the Fannie Allen campus. And I think when we first looked at, you know, the impact of that, we focused on the, the you know, just the lost surgical revenue, but, you know, ORs have, you know, a significant amount of downstream impacts as well. So when we look deeper, at the impacts it had to radiology volumes, physical therapy, lab, pharmacy, you know, you know, the the ratio of total revenue for an OR case can run between one and a half to two times what, you know, what the actual case itself produces for, for revenue. So the impact was pretty significant to closing down the Fannie Allen. We definitely did see uh, an impact from the Epic Go Live as well, but that was more of a one-time hit. It obviously impacted, um, you know, those early those early months in terms of, you know, making sure that we had accrued all the revenue that had actually transpired. Uh, we did take a, a cash hit, which we, you know, expected. Um, but um, the last uh, last couple months, um, after accounting for the COVID slowdown, we actually the cash collections are are we we've, we've essentially made up for all of the delay in cash um, and are back to baseline um, numbers um, in uh, in June July. But there definitely was a, a small impact in that January February time frame from just making sure that our financial statements um, were um, as accurate as possible with, you know, that that that, that system implementation. Because it was a, I mean, it, it was a big system implementation that took some while, you know, and we're still in that optimization phase, but took a while to get all the kind of kinks worked out of it. Maureen, this is Todd. Um, so one of the things is the, impl the implementation was a little rough for a variety of reasons. Uh, and that we did have to take external and internal resources and put them on the implementation to turn it around, you know, starting in the December timeline as, as well as January and stuff. I would say our extra spend, you know, in doing so was probably around $7 million for both internal and external costs. To Rick's point, we didn't lose any revenue and we didn't lose any cash in the process. As we, he mentioned, by June, we had corrected uh, just about everything that impacted the cash uh, and the revenue negatively. Uh, and as we've talked about COVID-19, you know, the hospitals have made up a lot of the COVID-19 backlogs, which would also include a lot of the epic backlogs. So I would say coming out of 2020, that we don't have any backlogs with regard to wave one and epic and that we've, we've collected the cash that we uh, had to collect. I would say that the one negative was the fact we did have to put more resources to fix the challenge in the very beginning of the implementation uh, and a lot of that was, uh, you know, due to, um, you know, some things, you know, the technology had some issues that needed work and some was on us with regard to how we built the technology to accommodate our medical center and what have you. So um, there was a little bit of both at that time. Uh, and we did have a little bit of a timing issue with regard to when we got the build done and the training. So people were being trained in advance of the build being completed. So when things went were turned on, it looked different to a lot of people. So there was that 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 was part of the the rush start that we had to uh, get through in December. Okay, and just one last thing on Epic, and and um, I would also include the Miller Building in this. You know, when you submit your CONs, one of the conditions is that it shall not increase commercial rates, right, to fund any expenses related to the project or any cost overruns. And, you know, what always, to me in this catch-22 is, is as you've talked about on your commercial rate increase, it's math. You, you kind of come up with a number of what's going to fill the gap to get you to the bottom line that you need to be at. And included in that are increases year over year for Epic. Uh, Miller maybe not so much the case this year. And so I struggle with how to think about that. And, and one ex specific example um, that was in the most recent um, EPIC application is we're adding the two New York hospitals. Um, and the, the, because 
UVM picks up the capital for that and the subscription fees that the New York hospitals will pick up is, is, is very small. They never would have been able to afford, afford this on their own. But the three Vermont hospitals are actually picking up about $2 million per what you submitted in, in your application, additional in 2021. And that's one example. Another example is there's been some movement between the um, capital expense, capital purchases versus expense categories. And should that increase, that hits the P&L differently than the capital, which would have been depreciated over five years. So just wonder if you could comment on that, because at the end of the day, when you're working up that math equation to, to figure out where you need to be at the bottom line, it is absorbing some increased costs for some of the CONs that the expectation was that won't be part of commercial. And I, and I know we could play kind of a shell game of what, what is the commercial increase related to and what's kind of just general, you know, falls to the bottom line. But, you know, to me, it, it does all work out to be coming out from the same number. So. Yes. Let me take the, for the beginning of that daughter. Yeah, if you want to do that, I'll finish. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I think uh, to go back to the to the way that we built the commercial rate increase, um, I think just important to, to to point out is that our total expenses are going up, obviously, by more than what we're that we're requesting at the commercial rate increase. And the commercial rate increase that the math that we're showing is based on the expense inflation. So it's how much, not that. You know, a cost may be going from, you know, 50 million to 60 million. That's a that's a true new, new cost. But how much of the cost is due to inflation? Meaning, salaries are going up, uh, pharmaceutical costs are going up, uh, the cost on med surge is going up. So that's the case that we've made in terms of why we need um, a particular commercial rate increase. So when you look at the, you know, when you look at the math, it's based on that $32 million, just the medical center, for example, it's based on that $32 million, which is just expense inflation, not, you know, the, the overall amount of costs that, uh, that are increasing, because that we obviously are covering um, in, in different ways, either it's through, um, you know, the, the increases that are due to volume increases or the, the outpatient pharmacy business. So I think I'll just... I'll stop there, Todd, if there's anything else to do. Yeah, you know, so Maureen, so, you know, to your point about the Miller Building, one of the things that the Miller Building uh, brought to us was uh, we had to figure out how to offset those costs and stuff, so we did not pass them on in the rates and what have you. And one of the things that we started to do as a network as part of the budgeting process is that, you know, there are uh, cuts and reductions and, let's say, uh, increase avoidance that we do as part of the process that you don't necessarily see in the numbers themselves and such. And those offsets and everything really get applied to these capital programs and everything. And uh, example would be, um, uh, you know, if we save some money in supply chain or we reduce some positions, you know, Rick was talking about artificial intelligence. We do in the finance area have programs that are doing the work that people used to do and those positions are no longer here. So. You know, we take things out and create offsets, believe it or not. I know that talking about this year's budget and the requests that you're seeing, you're saying, well, what would it have been if you didn't take these costs out? It would have been a lot higher. So we annually take costs out to offset a lot of these, the growth that we see in these things. And to your point, it's all fungible, right? We could sit there and say, well, this, this, it's that. We do look at the drivers for the, what our budget increases are that kind of get into the cost shift discussion as being the inflation push, right? So it's the labor, you know, supply and demand is pushing uh, price up in that market. Pharmaceuticals is being dictated to us each year by the pharmaceutical companies, what have you. Um, but with regard to, you know, building a network, there are going to be some investments, you know, whether it's a Workday or Premier Connect, that gives us the connectivity to get to the savings later on. So. One of the things that we're doing is trying to, to, to keep those expenses for Epic and the Miller building, you know, as offsets and everything, and then trying to deal with all the other pressures that we're seeing in a different way. Because when we do get the, uh, to the other side of having everything connected, as I mentioned before, that's when you'll start to see the reductions uh, with regard to duplication of labor, duplication of vendors, you know, a variety of other things that will start to, you'll start to see come out. 
And the other thing, too, to your point about capital and operations, you're right that there are a lot more, on a percentage basis, more dollars going into operations on IT software and platforms and what have you and such. However, we do have a significant, you know, capital investment that, you know, these things, you know, um, their useful lives are very limited. You know, it could be three, five, maybe on the outside, seven years. And you're going to see a huge drop in a really short period of time as this network connectivity is being done. Those things will mature and then you'll see the depreciation drop in a huge way. At that same time, you're going to see operating costs drop. Unfortunately, it's going to take a few years to get there and stuff. But. Uh, that's really where the savings will come from. It'll it'll come from the connectivity and then the maturation of those assets and everything as they're being you know um, retired because they're amortized at that point in time. So you know we'll we'll continue to bring you updates on where the savings are coming from. As I mentioned before, the consolidation of revenue cycle between the medical center and CVMC. The first position that went away was the pers the, the position that led revenue cycle at CVMC because it's going to be redundant going forward. We don't need it. But as we go through and plan to look at all these other positions, as those savings come out, we can clearly bring them to you. There'll be some of them will be offsets to the Epic prop, you know, project and others are going to be just, you know, network development projects that uh, are going to sit there and take costs out anyways and such. So, um, you know, we can bring those numbers to you uh, each year and stuff so you can start to see them. But, you know, we take costs out even prior to, you know, uh, getting to the base budgets and stuff. So. Yeah. So Todd, uh, okay. I would Thank like you. to add, so, uh, well, Maureen, I'd like to add something else, particularly on the medical center side, um, as it relates to Epic and the New York affiliates. About 15% of the total patient revenue that comes into the medical center is from the state of New York. And that varies a little bit each year, but it is in the range of 190 to 200 million dollars. So, you know, from a patient perspective and focusing on the patient as the focus, I mean, it makes sense to allocate part of our capital to the New York patients. And then I would also put out there that that 190 million to 200 million dollars also generates about $12 million worth of provider tax for the state of Vermont also. So I think the academic medical center um, is a little bit different than the other hospitals that we do need to have some understanding that um, a significant portion of their patient revenue comes from upstate New York. Okay. Um, okay. I I have a bunch more questions, but I'm sure my other board members are going to ask them, so I'm going to pass it on uh, <laughs> to the next ones. And if they don't, I'll come back later. Thanks. So at this point, we're going to turn to board member Holmes, Jessica. Great, thanks. Um, it's a marathon day. I was thinking maybe I was going to be the break for lunch, but apparently not. Um, okay, so obviously a tough year, unprecedented. Um, I think I'm ready for precedented. I'm not sure if everybody else is, but I would love to go back to precedented. Um, my first is actually a sincere thank you. Uh, obviously, none of us are going to really understand the days, the nights, and the weekends that your ops team spent dealing with this crisis. Uh, and to say nothing of the courage of your providers. So my guess is despite all of the signs and the thank yous and the flowers on cars, um, there's probably still not enough thank yous. So at least from me here today um, is one more thank you. Um, and so, you know, for the record, I will say I very much appreciate the need for hospitals to maintain adequate margins, to invest in infrastructure and technology and to be prepared for a rainy day, which I think we've seen firsthand, right? It's frankly been kind of a torrential downpour the last three months, so six months. So I think I, I get that and I hear you all in the presentation. Um, where I wanna go is a better understanding of um, medical inflation and the commercial rates. There's a lot of reference in the submission and in the presentation today to commercial rates not keeping pace with medical inflation. And in fact, the narrative states and comments today state that the, this year's commercial rate is the product of several years of rate increases that have not kept pace with inflationary pressures. So I guess I wanna unpack that a little bit with you all. And this is actually um, relevant to all three hospitals. We can talk about UVM here, but at the end of the day, it's the same analysis was done. So it's relevant to all the hospitals. 
And I want to dig into your analysis of what you're calling unit cost inflation. Um, since your estimate of the unit cost inflation is really high compared to other Vermont hospitals. Um, you know, within the breakdown of the commercial rate, you're reporting a unit cost inflationary component of between seven and eight percent for the three hospitals. And I guess what I want to make sure I want to uh, I think we're speaking a different language when it comes to medical inflation. And I want to bridge that gap if I can. Um, so throughout the presentation, um, you know, in, in slides 14 and then in all those slides where you break down the commercial rate into the components, you're effectively comparing commercial rate increases, which in my mind is a pure price effect, to expense increases, which is both a price and a volume effect. So when I think about the need for commercial rates to keep pace with medical inflation, I'm thinking about an apples to apples comparison, in this case price to price. So for example, even including the provider tax in unit cost inflation doesn't make sense to me unless the actual provider tax rate has changed, right? It's still 6%. So there's no price inflation associated with the provider tax. Any growth is really just a volume effect. So to me, in my mind, I'm thinking about a commercial price increase. It's a change in price charge to commercial payers. Medical inflation, to me, unit price inflation is a change in the cost of a given basket of medical goods, the price alone effect, right? So it doesn't make sense to me, I'm laboring this point, but to compare price on one hand and price and volume on the other hand. In the extreme, if your, pri if your prices were kept constant and only volume grew, your expenses would grow, but you wouldn't call that medical inflation, right? So this is where I struggle. Um, the larger com components of medical inflation seem to be the compensation, right? Wages, salaries of your employees, medical supplies, med service supplies, and pharmaceutical. So Rick, for UVM, you actually described the pure inflation price effect on slide 26 as 3%. On slide 31, you calculate expense inflation as 2.2%. So I might look at that and say, well, that's their medical inflation rate, 2.2 to 3% for UVM. That's by how much that fixed basket of goods of people, supplies, and pharmaceutical drugs are actually growing, right? So then when I look at the commercial rate requests for each hospital, and we can talk about UVM here, but again, like I said, it, it carries over to the other hospitals. We're talking about commercial rate increases of 8%, 8.5% for uh, CVMC, 5.8% for quarter. Um, medical inflation to me, or unit cost inflation, would be that 2 to 3%. It wouldn't be these 7 to 8% unit cost inflation numbers that you have, because that's not actually unit cost inflation. That's price times quantity. So you're so it doesn't make sense to me. Can you help me unpack that? Or maybe what I would say is for each hospital, could you submit a new breakdown of commercial rate that really only includes price effects? Because what I would say is if, if your inflation rate is two to three percent, the commercial rate increases over the last few years have actually kept pace with medical inflation. Does that make sense? Yeah, I can mute it and start, <laughs> so I can start, and then Mark can probably uh, follow up. So I think, so you're right. So that the the true medical inflation is that two to three percent, and that truly is, you know, in terms of when we put our budgets in the system, everybody puts their budgets, you know, FTEs and everything, and so we've got a base number, and then we apply our inflation assumptions to that. So how much do we think salaries are going to go up? What do we think inflation is going to be on pharmaceuticals? So that that number is that two to three percent that you're um, that you're. So that probably makes you know probably makes sense to makes a little bit more sense. In the math that we were showing on the commercial rate increase, that it's still that number. So it's still that thirty-two million dollar number is the true inflation piece. The math that we did on that slide was to show the fact that um, that the commercial rate, the commercial business has to essentially pick all of that up um, because we're not getting any of the rate increase on Medicare and Medicaid. And so it's essentially double the amount of that true um, expense inflation, uh, which is probably why it may not look, you know, it may not look correct because it's, it's, it's essentially, it's covering. Okay. So maybe what would help me is a breakdown of each of the commercial rate increases, two to 3%, 
and it may differ by hospital, I recognize that, but let's just call it two to three percent is, is medical inflation. That's unit cost inflation. Then what you need or you, you are adding to that is some cost shift, right? Some price related cost shift. So that would be helpful to break out because that's not medical inflation, that's cost shift. And that is very, very different. And so, you know, especially when you're saying commercial rate increases have not kept pace with medical inflation, they haven't kept pace with medical inflation plus cost shift. That may be true, but they have kept pace roughly with medical inflation. So it's it's a different analysis there. Um, and it would be helpful to know what the cost shift is by payer um, impact on the overall commercial rate because, for example, I know you've you've budgeted at least for UVM a 3.7% increase for Medicare inpatient, right? Which sounds to me like that's actually going to cover medical inflation. Perhaps not for outpatient, as you've described, it may be flat or decreasing. So for Medicare, it's it's I don't know what that net effect would be, but it's not too far off of inflation if you're getting 3.7 for Medicare. Medicaid sounds like it's flatlining. So clearly, the majority of the cost shift that's going to be required of commercial patients to, to incur is coming from Medicaid. Would that be correct? Um, so the Medicare assumption for rate is just on inpatient, and actually it's on that slide. So the, okay. on, those, on those slides, the lines that you saw there that said offsets by other payers. Okay, that so that's already included. So it's essentially buying down some of that commercial rate increase if we do assume that we're going to get an increase from somewhere else. Okay, perfect. So maybe when you, if you break it down by payer, we can actually identify what the Medicaid component is, because right now it's all netting out, right? If I understand you correctly. Okay. Um, you know, and so related to that, I mean, it's a struggle, and I think my, I I understand exactly the rock and the hard place that you are in. You know, it's hard to squeeze water from a stone, getting more reimbursement out of Medicare, Medicaid, and certainly out of Medicare farther away. But at some point, so I look at the average commercial to Medicare reimbursement that was submitted. You know, and it, according to your submission, it's 252 percent, right? So that already suggests a pretty hefty cost shift. If something costs $100 for Medicare, that means a commercial patient is paying $252 for that. So I guess I'm just wondering at what point, if I understand that's how that calculation, what that calculation means, at what point is that percentage, that ratio of average commercial reimbursement to Medicare reimbursement just becoming too much for commercial patients to endure? Like that. At what point are we saying, okay, we can't keep cost shifting to some other, you know, questions from some others? So, okay, Jessica, this is Mark and we can follow up on it, but I think we attempted to do that rate sensitivity on slide 21. I mean, yeah. oh, oh, okay, so because, because like for the medical center, that 2.2% or 31.7 million is, is, um, is is basically that is only with the unit cost and you know we divide it by with the budget impact um up above and i think this is where the difference in the calendar year and the hospital fiscal year come into play that we all need to be sensitive to um so you know i think this deserves more more discussion, but in the hospital year, they are attempting to make up that inflation over a nine month period. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you know, your starting point when you take that 2.2% from um, a commercial perspective, you need to divide that by 0.75 well, to get the correlation to the commercial, you know, rate even as a starting point. And the other thing I would say, um, uh, on the cost shift, um, the numbers on the cost shift are even greater. And and I'm only using some hypothetical numbers here, by the way, um, is 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 that if Medicare or Medicaid, and I'm using these numbers to make the math simple, uh -huh. but if Medicare or Medicaid only funds 50% of cost, okay, and the true unit cost inflation is 3%, they actually need a 6% increase just to stay status quo with that because they're only funding 50% of the current cost. So, so, you know, I think, I think all of this, you know, you know, it, it warrants more conversation, but that's what we attempted to do on slide 21. Um, and, and, and then like specifically to the medical center, if we take a look at that, um, uh, 
that 6.7%, um, which is basically taking the 31.7 million as a unit cost inflation and dividing it by the per 1% impact on, on the budget year, 4.7 million, that equals 6.7%. And then if you take take out the other payer adjustments down below at 0.62%, and you net those two, that's about that 6% well, that Rick was talking to on his slide every single year that, you know, that is the equivalent um, uh, of the unit cost and the cost shift. Um, you know, the reality is, 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 is that, you know, Balancing all of these is becoming more and more complicated um, for many reasons. And, you know, um, and, and, but what has been funding this a little bit more is what, you know, the deterioration on the bottom line. And, 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 and I think, and I can't help but to think how worse the situation would have been if, if the hospitals weren't able to find that additional other revenue, well, like, you know, like, um, like Rick was talking to. So it's complicated. Um, happy yeah. to sit down and show all of the numbers and all of the detail. Obviously, there's a lot of detail on slide 20. Uh, um, um, I think to correlate the two processes together, I do think you need to combine both. Uh, um, well, for many different reasons, but um, happy to engage in that conversation. And you know, we have all the all of the detail between the numbers. You know, um, and we'll just take the conversation from there. Yeah, and I just I think to, part of my concern is like we're thinking about sustainability planning, and frankly, what I think we need to be having more conversations with with the legislature and Diva around the sustainability of Medicaid funding. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I, 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 I mean, I mean. <laughs> I can tell you the cost shift if you take a look at the medical center and there's multiple ways to calculate the cost shift and there's different opinions all over the place but you know if you if you take a look at our cost accounting system the cost shift is greater than 300 million a year for the medical center yeah so i just think if you were to break down so people understood the commercial rate and what the component is of pure medical inflation and what are the components of medicaid cost shift medicare cost shift it'd be really helpful because right now it's all being lumped into yeah. one bucket and i don't think that's i think don't think that's quite accurate cost shift is not the same thing as medical inflation so anyway i don't want to belabor that point um but or at least to me it isn't so it'd be helpful to kind of carve out what are, what is driving that commercial rate increase and what is the pure inflation and what is the other components. Um, so this is a question about um, in, in the budget submission, in the answer to some of the um, technical questions, uh, it's stated we're current, this is an answer about FTEs and staffing. So the, the, the it was quoted as saying, we are currently down five positions and we'll only get back to pre-COVID staffing and position levels if our volumes necessitate being at those levels. So it sounded like, at least when that submission was made, and I understand that may have been, you know, weeks ago, um, there was a sense that you're down five positions and you'll only get back to pre-COVID staffing levels if the volumes are there. But then I, I was then surprised when I saw on slide 31 talking about 18 new physicians and 129 new staff. So that sounds like not only are you back to pre-COVID staffing, or maybe that's, maybe I'm missing some where that calculation is being made, but if these are net new physicians and net new staff over 2020 budget, help me understand some of the assumptions about volume in terms of, um, you know, pre-COVID to, to where you expect you're gonna be. And I know you had some slides in there around volume and I appreciated those, but I'm trying to get a sense of it's just a, 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 a a number like we expect to be at 95% of our volume. We expect to be at 110% of our volume, something like that. It'll allow us to do an apples to apples comparison to other hospitals who have largely predicted they're gonna be at 90 to 90% of 90, 90 to 95% of volume because of COVID, because of the need for sanitizing, because of the need for screening, the, the need for uh, people's, you know, the expectation that some people have fear of going back to the 
doctor going back to the hospital. So volume seemed to be down. And I'm trying to get a sense of what's happening, what's different at the at UVM and frankly at some of the other hospitals too, but I can ask that later. So I think all three of us took the same approach in terms of building volumes. I mean, we started with the, the basic kind of through January, February timeframe. And so that, that was the basic building block of all of our budgets because right. the trying to, 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 to project the impacts that uh, might be present in the fall and the rest of the year in terms of COVID impacts were at that point in time where, you know, it was just a complete, you know, a complete crapshoot. So, um, so our budgets are, you know, based on that pre-COVID period. So the assumptions you see that was in our slide for volume assumptions were, were based on that. The FTEs that you see on that are the FTEs that are, that are required to get to that level. But the answer to the question um, in terms of where we're at currently, you know, that's what we're going to be managing. I mean, if we don't get to those, you know, that volume level that we've built in our budgets, we're not going to get to this 129 FTE increment either. Um, so what we have in place now is, um, you know, as volumes come up, that position management group that I spoke of that meets every Monday that takes a look at, you know, where are we at in terms of volumes? What do we need? Um, that's only incrementally growing as volumes are growing. So if we don't get to the volume numbers that we have in our budget, we're not getting to this 129 FTEs either. Okay. And Jessica, I would just add that since uh, early July, the medical center inpatient volume has been pretty much normal come for a normal summer. And mm -hmm. our OR volumes have been increasing. And I know that most of the last couple of weeks, our OR volume has been you know 98% or so of normal, so very close. Um, so assuming going into the fall, it's gonna be similar. Like now some patients we're seeing differently. I think I saw that about 30% of our primary care visits are um, by telemedicine now to make sure we can socially distance in those offices. But for the summer, we've at least been running very close to normal uh, capacity. Okay, um, that does seem to be a somewhat of a different story for some of the other hospitals, so um, it's interesting. Okay, and I guess my last question really is, is it possible to identify specific COVID-related expenses that are gonna carry into 2021, whether that be the staff required to be the screeners, the sanitizers, the PPE expenses, the testing you know, capacity increase, whatever that would be, could you carve out the COVID-related expenses that are a part of the 2021 budget for us? Obviously not here right now, but maybe a follow-up. Yeah, I mean, I can tell you there's very there's very little in there um, because right now we're and that's why you're not you're not seeing like increases for screeners or anything on that slide that um, that we included there because the assumption is that we're um, you know that one we're still looking at technology. Uh, Anna mentioned her thermal screener uh, screening system that they have at, at CBMC. Uh, we're looking at similar things where the COVID related expenses right now we're anticipating that are going to be you know, for the most part funded. So we didn't include the expense, we didn't include the funding for that incremental expense either in our uh, okay. budget. Great, and that's true for all three hospitals? I'm assuming? Yeah. Okay, great, I don't have to ask that question later. All right, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jess. Uh, next is board member Lund, Robin. Hi, thank you. Um, and I will, of course, echo all of my colleagues' thank yous. Um, for all that you and the staff have been doing during the crisis. Um, I just have a few follow-ups um, uh, on some of the related issues that folks have talked about. Um, so I, I was curious if you could speak a little bit to whether the suspension of the Medicare sequestration during, the, during 2020 will have much of an Im offsetting impact on your budget. Uh, so for the medical center right now, that's worth about four hundred and eighty thousand um, a month. Um, but what we're learning, um, and actually even when it was done, that there's there's a possibility that that money might be pulled back at some point. That that sequestration, you know, there may be something that's done to recoup some of that um, that uh, that uh, that amount. Uh, right now, it's scheduled to go through, I think, through the end of uh, December um, yeah. with, again, the potential that 
you know, there may be some pullback at, uh, at some point. And okay, and so um, in terms of how it's reflected in your 2021 budget, is that reflected in your Medicare rate assumption of 3.7%? No, we don't have that 480,000 for those three months in there. Okay, thank you. Um, I would love to hear a little bit more about the telehealth experience in terms of, um, I know that was a very fast uh, implementation for folks. How did it go? Um, it sounds like from what you've said a little bit um, that it's been going pretty well. 30% of primary care uh, currently by telehealth. Um, so I just wanted to hear a little more about that experience. I'll start. Um, so I think um, you know there was a lot of terrible things from COVID-19, but a positive was that it probably made us do 10 years of telehealth in about five weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, our IT team stepped up to the plate in a huge way and did a, a tremendous amount of work. And during the peak of the co in the pandemic, we really were not letting very few people into the offices. Some of those weeks we were doing, you know, 60 or 70 percent of primary care visits um, by telehealth. And, and I can tell you that I have friends and family and neighbors who are getting uh, care that way. And overall, we're very accepting. Um, I know someone who, you know, had a dermatology visit and was told, okay, that is something I have to see. Two days later was in the office. So I think our patients in general liked it. I think a lot of patients aren't going back. Mm -hmm. And I think it's making sure that we're doing the right care by telehealth. So we're not adding burden to either our providers or our patients. I'll also tell you that our providers actually liked it a lot and found some efficiency. And my favorite joke is um, one of our longtime neurosurgeons who doesn't really like computers was bragging to me one day in the hall that he had done his first three patients by telehealth and he actually was going to come to work the next day. <laughs> you know, he actually <laughs> felt that he could do it and see people and share the x-rays and everything. So I think our providers were forced into it to be clear, but really actually liked it. And it's it's here to stay. It's not going away. Our patients demand it, and I would tell you most of our providers like it. And what would you? What do you think is? Because um, quite frankly, we've heard sort of mixed reviews uh, from different hospitals. With a lot of people having picked up the telehealth, a couple hospitals not really. Um, but I'm curious if there's anything that you would attribute to some of the success of. Uh, both patients and providers liking it, just sort of some lessons learned. I would, I would say IT support is critical. So from a, I'll tell you from a provider so side, you want it to be easy. You want to be able to push a button, have it happen, be able to see your patient, not have technical glitches. Um, we're building it into Epic, into uh, My Health, and that'll really make it easy for everybody because everything will be contained in one site. So if, if you have that ability, to embed it in your EMR, that's clearly the best way to go. And you cannot make it difficult for patients or providers so they'll abandon it. As soon as you have one clunky thing where it fades in and out, that visit's ending, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, so really important to have it run as smooth as you can. And that's not easy in Vermont. You know, Vermont has a lot right. of areas with broadband issues. And um, so, and then, you know, I, I think in the beginning, providers probably need some hold, hand holding. A lot of providers don't love IT or EMRs. So having some support in the office, I think, was also critically important. Early on, we were making rapid changes, having IT there, having early adopters help their partners through it, I think was a big deal. Great. Thank you. Um, did you also have a lot of providers doing phone visits? Yes. Telephone visits? We had, so we actually had a lot of phone visits prior to COVID, but that increased exponentially um, during COVID-19 as a way to keep people safe. And so I know a lot of our um, pediatricians and primary care were able to manage a lot of issues by phone for people who either couldn't do telehealth, didn't have access, or didn't require it. Great. Thank you. Um, I wonder if you could uh, also speak a little bit to uh, travelers. Usually we hear a little bit more about number of travelers up or down. Um, what we have seen from a lot of other hospitals is a number of hospitals have actually been able to eliminate their travelers. Now, I think as an academic medical center, that's a little maybe a little bit different 
story, but I'm curious to hear more about uh, what's going on with travelers, how COVID impacted it, what you're expecting for 21. So it was a mixture, like everything else with COVID, um, we started eliminating travelers. We had some that were on a contract that we continued. There are certain areas that we do not have enough um, nurse capacity for specialty. So um, some of our OR areas, we have to use travelers. Um, we have been using ER nurse travelers, but I was just down there on Friday and they told me that um, they're gonna be able to be, almost have no travelers by this fall. So I actually have the data in front of me. Right now at the medical center, we have a total of 120 travelers. Um, that's a little below average, I would say, Rick, right? 120. Um, and they're really for specialty areas. They're for areas that we do not have enough capacity here. Um, 50 of those end in October. We think we won't need those. And I also know that over the past six months, we've added on 168 permanent nurses. And we were able to, we, we you know, we delayed a bunch of new hires for the new grads and stuff. But uh, our chief nursing officer told me on Thursday that we've been able to make almost all that up. We've gotten almost all of our new hires. Um, so I think it's a mixed bag. I think we won't know the full impact for a little longer. Great. Well, thank you. Um, um, I have, I, I, Rick, I just have to comment on something that you said when you were talking about the FTEs and the coding in terms of um, getting volumes to the level that it can support FTEs. I really don't see how that's consistent with moving to fixed payments and fixed budgets. So I wondered if you could just comment on that. Sorry, can you say that one more time? So sure. When, when, to the coding? Yeah, when you were talking about the FTE levels and trying to keep tight on maintaining FTE levels to keep labor costs in line, um, you, in, and I, I think this was in response to one of Tom's questions. I can go back and try and find it in my notes, but um, it struck me that um, in you, what you were saying is that you need to get your revenue volumes up in order to meet your FTE expenses. And it just seems to me inconsistent with where we're trying to go with fixed payments. Um, so I think maybe there was a couple times where I mentioned, so it's actually the opposite. We're not going to increase FTEs unless the volume dictates it in terms of the, you know, the, the volume or the, the, the labor intensive areas. So they're essentially clinical positions. So unless the volume dictates it, then, you know, we're only going to increase FTEs at that same pace. In terms of administrative FTEs, actually, that's where there's, there's opportunities. I think the coding, um, when Tom and I were talking about the coding impact, there, the, the 3M 360 product actually has the opportunity to reduce the number of coders that we have. So right now, that clinical documentation process involves a coder taking a look at, at a note, they review it, they send an email through my chart to the provider, he or she looks at it, goes back to the coder and says, yeah, you know, I can, I can change the documentation, I can't, that sort of thing. That product will actually do it in real time that it will eliminate uh, FTEs, um, not increase FTEs. So I don't know if that helps clarify. Yes, that helps. Thank you. That helps clarify. Um, so I think that's it for my UVM questions. I do have a couple network questions, but I would like to take when our break to kind of formulate those in a better way so that they're more articulate. So that's just a heads up, Kevin. Thank you, Robin. So um, when the federal dollars came out on the uh, rural portion, um, UVM Burlington um, really was treated what it appears to be very unfairly when you compare it to a similar size system at Dartmouth and, and the, uh, the dollars that didn't flow to UVM Burlington. Has there been any um, progress by the congressional delegation to try to create some equity there? Um, I'll start. So uh, we worked very hard with a congressional delegation um, with the AHA to advocate for fairness and consistency. And we've heard um, from many um, fronts that uh, we th they think they are going to correct the process. I actually talked to um, uh, Rick Pollack from the AHA last week, and he said that the um, 
The government is planning to actually, on a one-by-one -one basis, try to go back in and correct some of those, but we haven't heard anything yet to count that we can rely on. Okay. Have you applied for the FEMA grants that uh, are available? We have. Yeah, that's in process. Uh, they're due on the 1st, and we'll meet uh, September 1st, and we're going to meet that uh, deadline. How much would you hope to get in that? Uh, right now, it looks like it's a little over $9 million. And likewise, um, what, what's your your hope that of uh, what you'll receive in the state CRF funding? Uh, between the cost um, share components, so FEMA only covers seventy five percent. So what we applied in the state grant was the twenty five percent cost share, and then the the telehealth costs that aren't covered by federal uh, dollars looks like it's about uh, three point three million. That's it. That's it. Wow. Well, I'm concerned that there's going to be a lot of uh, dollars left uh, on the table as we uh, look at what hospitals around the state uh, have put in for, but it is what it is. Um, Just to clarify, too, uh, uh, Chair Mullen, the, we did also, for the hospitals that are part of the risk uh, components in the ACO, we did. Um, uh, we did apply for the delta between the fixed payments and the fee-for-service delta between March and June. Um, so that was part of our uh, request to the state as well. And how much would that equal? So that was a little over $9 million as well. Okay. Um, Todd spoke a lot about um, what you're seeing as far as, um, and I can tell you that I had the same type of reaction because uh, in the past, a number of uh, employees at the Green Mountain Care Board had sought the possibility of working remotely. And of course, I routinely denied it. Um, but what we've seen is that um, people have learned that they can be productive and sometimes more productive working remotely. And we've seen this national trend where a number of companies um, throughout the country are cutting their their uh, footprint as far as office space and everything. And given Todd's comments, I was wondering if UVM was going to um, avail themselves of the um, problems that are occurring at city center to um, extricate them from that high priced uh, office space. Um, I'll take that one. Um, uh, we made it clear um, uh, even pre-COVID and in our conversations all along that as the um, uh, project got delayed and delayed, our likelihood of participation diminished significantly. Um, and um, uh, I've um, uh, been clear that with our financial situation, with what uh, you just mentioned, the uh, moving uh, landscape of people working from home that uh, we're not in the market for additional office space at this point. Uh, as a matter of fact, the old uh, uh, IDX building, the GE Health building, um, uh, working with our IT leadership, uh, there's uh, capacity there. Uh, Todd Keating made this point. Um, moving parts, but we will be uh, uh, working to um, be as efficient as we can with office space, and we're certainly not looking for uh, new incremental space at this time. Thank you. And Chairman Mullins, I would just add that at the medical center, we've started a project here to figure out, you know, how many people should permanently work from home, what would they need to do that successfully, how does that impact other work here, where we have people that might share desks once a week. And so we've actually started some work here asking our leaders to think, help us think through that. And, and just like telehealth is here to stay, we see work to home for some component of our workforce. I can't tell you the exact percentage, but some percentage of our workforce will work from home, some either permanently or maybe come to work one day a week or something like that. Okay, thank you, Steve. Um, that's all that I had for questions. I think what I'm going to do is um, have us take a break now. We'll come back after the break um, and have the um, HCA questions and then move to public comment on the 
UVM Burlington. Um, so uh, what we'll do is we will break now and come back at 145 and resume. So enjoy your lunch, everyone. Stretch out. Um, sitting in these chairs for this long can, can be <laughs> problematic. So uh, we'll we'll see you again at 145. Thank you. Thank you.